All right, so I've already started some of the Sound of Freedom freedom research. Uh, I've been working on the script to it a bit. I have tons of spelling errors, but it's not the point. Point is, is I just thought it'd be kind of cool maybe to stream some of the researching process of this and see how that goes. If anybody's interested in watching this, doubtful, but we'll see. So give me a second. I didn't do like a starting screen or anything like that. That involves effort. Um, Any bedoozle. All right. So I got to remember how to stream on YouTube. Normally I stream on Twitch, but I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stream on YouTube with this. Why not? You know, why not? Anyway, what I'm going to be doing is just watching a bunch of Sound of Freedom stuff, looking up stuff and uh, building the script. And then I will shoot everything and then I will probably stream the editing process. I'm thinking about maybe streaming more of the behind the scenes process because I why not? You know what I mean? So, why not? Anyway, so I'm watching first the uh, Jordan P. Uh, Peterson interview with Jim Caviezel and uh, Tim Ballard because they're I've listened to this already. Uh, I've watched some of these videos. I've listened to some of these videos. So, like, I'm a little bit privy to what, uh, what some things I'm looking for are already. Um, so, I'm just wanting to grab a few things. But also, I think it's this one he mentions about... So, there's a guy they arrest very early on, whose name is, I don't know. Uh, it's like Oshkins something. Hold on. Uh, Sound of Freedom. Where is he at? You're not going to have a there he is. They don't have his full name. Sound of Freedom. This. I'm trying to find his full name. Ernest. I don't know who Caleb Park is. But I was trying to find this. I think he says something about here, about this being a real guy, but I can't find the real guy. Uh, Sound of Freedom film packing out theaters right now is based on incredible true story. Blah, blah, blah. Update Tim Ballard, the former R CEO, filed a motion to being sued for four separate lawsuits, yada, yada, yada. I saw the movie in a crowded theater on Monday in Finland, Ohio. I was moved to tears on the edge of my seat, and by the end credits, I wanted to know how I could help in human trafficking. Pay it forward. That's how you pay it forward. Uh, God's Children are the line delivered by Jim Caviezel, the Passion of the Christ actor who plays Ballard. So with me, blah, blah, blah. where's the part about Oshkinski? How do you find? There we go. Well, signed his book to Tim before giving it, uh, before being arrested. True. Ballard said the man identified as Ernest Oshkinski is based on a real life case and the arrest in the coffee shop where he signed his book for him actually happened. A true story of a guy in the film they called Oshinsky. He was one of the more prolific collectors of child exploitation material that I've ever seen. He had over two million pieces of that material, and it was an interesting case because he was very intellectual. He had written a lot about that, justifying it, making a lot of legal arguments for it. He even a book. He had even written a book. Ballard said, "I read the book before taking him down." Uh, the film doesn't give backstory of his arrest, but Ballard said he wouldn't talk during the in interrogation until he tried something new. I decided to try something crazy that I never tried before because I had read so much of his material. I believe that he would believed that men are naturally attracted to children. So I said, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, so we're just passing over that. I know all this was real. I don't care negotiate with. Uh, Vampiro, Adrian was based on a real person. I know, we're getting to that. 
Um. Oh, cool. So this person goes into the QAnon stuff. It's interesting. Uh, all right. Well, I want to try to find this guy. Real life Osinski. Because the problem is, is I can't find any information on the real person. Tim, well, maybe just try this. Tim Ballard Coffee Coffee Shop Arrest. Um, the problem is, is you just get the same news stories. So how do you know this is true? Where's the... Um, I'm going to look this up off stream, but Ernest Oshinsky author. Okay. So there's this, this is a article from the Catholic Herald. Um, I'm sure it's going to see. That's the only time they mention him. Well, that's just a plot synopsis of the movie. Uh, you know, attention yeah, to the mainstream media oftentimes is more innocent and cynical, perhaps, where it's just, just I will watch everything at two speed. Just too dark. Way. I don't want to expose our audience to this horrific thing. Um, you know, we I, I film we film our operations. I mean, I, I'm going to post today another operation in, in West Africa of a baby factory. I mean, these are real cases where they've, they've kidnapped women, um, as young as 13 year old children, and they impregnate them, they rape them, and they make babies, and they take these babies and sell them for their organs, sell them for sex, sell them for satanic ritual abuse. Like it, it, it does sound crazy. That's why I film it. Our operations, we film our operations so that we can show the world this is very real. It's really happening. Um, and I think if there's two million children forced into commercial sex, which is the, the most uh, kind of credible statistic that we can find, uh, a lot of people are involved. So there's a more cynical answer to your question, which may be there's people who don't want this exposed because they're involved in it. So I'm going to harass you a bit here um, from the Wikipedia page. Um, there is some, not that I'm a particular fan of Wikipedia pages, uh, depending on the circumstances, but there are some criticisms of what you're doing. And I thought we might as well um, address them right off the bat, bat because people who are watching are going to be, look, man, if I was coming across this for the first time, and in some ways I am, I've got two choices in front of me, don't I? I can either presume that you've discovered something that's ongoing and of tremendous significance that's terribly dark, or I can assume that the difficult work that you had done for a decade um, genuinely addressing these problems has made you hypersensitive to a threat and willing to magnify it, and it would be easier just to ignore you as a consequence. Now, that would be the preferable um, outcome to such an investigation, wouldn't it? So you can, as, as you said, you can understand why people might want to avert their eyes from such a thing. So I'm going to walk through these criticisms, and maybe you could, you know, you can respond to them, and we can get that out of the way before we go deeper into the film and, and your your uh, and your your uh, your operations. So so your group, and this is Operation Underground Railroad, and tell me if I get anything wrong here, says it devours conspiracy theories. Though founder Tom Ballard was criticized for refusing to condemn the QAnon conspiracy theory, um, I have no idea what the hell that means. Do you know what that's referring to? Yeah, absolutely. We um, that's, that's that's a line on Wikipedia. We have absolutely in our FAQs for years have have condemned the majority of, of what we see um, with conspiracy theories. Uh, so I, I, they like to attribute me to the QAnon movement. Um, there may be some truths in there, but there's so many falsehoods on top of that. So our, our FAQs refute that immediately um, because it, it can it discredits the movement. In fact, I would go so far as to consider that maybe certain people who don't want this known are responsible for some of the conspiracy theories in order to discredit the movement. Um, and uh, they go too far. They go too far in, in, in their assessment of things. But yeah, we actually have this disavowed uh, what's generally coming out of, of, of QAnon. Yeah, well, it says you know it's very vague on Wikipedia. It says to condemn the QAnon conspiracy theory. Well, I know perfectly well that there are more than one conspiracy theories, let's say, on QAnon, so I'm not even exactly sure what it's referring to. What is there a particular conspiracy theory that um, you were criticized for refusing to condemn? Do you, do you have any more specific details about that? I mean, I, I'm not sure what exactly they're, they're talking about. Probably they might be uh, referring to the fact that there's something called adrenochrome where they, you know, they, they take, they're taking children's blood and devouring it and so forth. Uh, and I've explained my experience with that, and, and I just did in West Africa and other places. Um, we've seen this in, in several parts of the continent of Africa. And it's very real. It's very real. It's witch doctory. They take these children. We, they, they, they take their organs. They take their blood. They, they, they drink it. They take the genitalia of children. And... I... Okay, that's a lot. Over the rooftop of their businesses, thinking that the, the dark gods would bless them. That's a lot. Um, and so I might say something like that, and then they connect it to something uh, that a QAnon person says about you know a celebrity 
who must be doing this too, but there's no evidence to back that. And they make, they make a, a false connection there. Um, and, and so that's, that's the only example I can think of. Okay, got it. Well, the next thing it says is that the, the Operation Underground Railway falsely claimed that it had entered a partnership with American Airlines. That was in 2022. So what, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do you have to say about that? Oh, that's a great one. So uh, a PR What's firm, the matter uh, about American uh, Airlines? Uh, made a deal with American so Airlines. So stupid. Uh, came to us and said, shoot the video. They're going to put this video on your, uh, we're going to put this video on the airlines. They shot the video of me. I just get a call from a PR company, put me in a studio. I give a video that I think I'm talking to the passengers for one month uh, on American Airlines. Apparently the deal fell through. The PR company didn't tell us that. And our, our marketing company, our marketing team put out, hey, we're going to be on American so Airlines. So it wasn't necessarily Oshkinsky. They said we can't make um, a message to you, and that was it. And of course, there's people that want so badly for us to be wrong or us to not do what we say we do. So they exploited that. I think that was a nice magazine, very previous on this uh, journal. Uh, I can't call it record. journalist. Um, the Vice magazine did, did a series of hit pieces on us. And I, I encourage people. I encourage people to read it. Read Vice. Read Vice because everything they say is so ridiculous and so dishonest. Right. I know. I, I do believe. I know. It's Vice all the new stuff. The last few weeks, and I can't imagine an organization more richly deserving. There was a 2021 follow-up article from Vice, but I don't think we're going to. I'll just read part of it because it's so ridiculous. Conflating consensual sex work with sex trafficking. Yeah. Well, that's exactly the kind of Weasley. Um, what would you call it? Criticism that I'd expect from people who are trying to justify the sorts of behaviors that you. Uh, are to I'm trying uh, to figure out 21 article in shut up uh, I'm trying to figure out this this is like the story I'm trying to find right now and I'm not having a good good chance of finding it I'm not having a, uh, any luck of finding it I decided to so he's claiming this is real but like this guy's just saying it's true because Ballard said so uh There's the Earl Buchanan. I already went over that. Not on stream. Oh, come on. Uh-uh. Maybe he'll say his name in this. Slate, criticizing a 2014 raid conducted by Operation Underground Railway in the Dominican Republic, saying that it was likely to have traumatized the traffic children. Um, Anne Gallagher, an authority on human trafficking, wrote in 2015 that OUR had an alarming lack of understanding about how sophisticated criminal trafficking networks must be approached and dismantled and called the work of OUR arrogant, unethical, and illegal. So, Anne, have a way at that. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. So, someone like Anne Gallagher, who lives 3,000 miles away from any operation we've ever done, is not qualified to talk about what our operations. She, she can't give any uh, details. She can't give any examples. Um, the Slate article is a fun one to address. I've addressed it several times. Um, we um, Early on, we brought a blogger down to do to, to watch our operations. We, we invite people down. Like Tony Robbins has been down. Um, we invite politicians. The Attorney General of Utah has come on our operations. Um, if we're hiding something, that's the last thing we would, of course, do. So, we bring this journalist, this blogger, I won't call her journalist, um, and she, we thought she was a friend, and she came and watched a legitimate operation happen in, in, uh, in Dominican Republic. Uh, there were seven traffickers who showed up, seven traffickers arrested. There were um, 20 plus uh, people rescued. Nine of them were children. You can't, you can't sometimes, you can't always. Uh, control who shows up to the sting party the traffickers bring who they will but nine children uh, showed up they were all liberated from the the, the, the um you know the control of their captors um this blogger then wrote two glowing stories about it that she witnessed this she had very minimal exposure to the operation itself she, she witnessed it some seven years later she decides to use it in my opinion to somehow increase her social media it's gonna be a lot of cutting through the like, bullshit as our foundation grew, and she writes a story that it's in slate now here's, here's the key thing um Nine children rescued, and nine children had three years of aftercare services in this operation provided by International Justice Mission, one of the top authorities in aftercare and, and, and fighting human trafficking. Um, seven traffickers were not only arrested, but all seven were convicted. So she chose the wrong case to criticize. Now, tellingly, if, if anyone's going to write a story about that operation, good, bad, or otherwise, and they leave out the part that says seven traffickers were arrested and seven traffickers were convicted, and nine children... Maybe it's in this part. A real story based on the film. We work for the special forces, per se, and who were you working for before you decided to forego your career and to pursue this the case that we're describing? So I worked for 12 years as a special agent and undercover, undercover operator for the Department of Homeland Security, the investigative division called Homeland Security Investigations. Ten of those years were spent on the border, uh, tracking child traffickers, uh, people who exploit children with child exploitation material. So I really learned a lot. In 2006, the laws changed in the United States. And for the first time, U.S. agents were permitted and encouraged to go overseas and find children who Americans were abusing. And we can now hold those Americans accountable as if they had committed that crime on U.S. soil. That's, that's what really changed my life because I started, I speak Spanish fluently and they sent me overseas, south of the border. That's when my eyes opened up and I started seeing the children that I used to only see mostly on the, on the pornography, on the, on the child exploitation material cases. Um, but it was tormenting me, uh, the U.S. government unwittingly was, because if I couldn't find that connection back to the United States, the American kid or the American pedophile, I had to come home. But the problem is I've, I've already been exposed to the children. I've already been exposed to the problem and oftentimes I've made myself the bait. 
And in 2012, I had enough on this case. I kind of went more, I went further than otherwise I probably should have. Uh, the movie didn't have time to tell you that there was another case in Haiti at the same time that I was working, uh, thinking there was a U.S. nexus. And I was told in both instances to come home and you couldn't work these cases. Uh, and that's when I had a very consequential conversation with my wife. And I said, if I stay here, if I do this operation with or without my badge, it doesn't matter at this point, I, I, I can do the work. Uh, we will save kids. Um, and, um, but I, I have to lose my job and we have six children. And this is, this is a moral dilemma like I've never faced in my life. And I was hoping my wife would have responded with, get your ass home. You can't. You can't abandon us. You know, first of all, you're going to die without the, the top cover of the U.S. government if you continue this. And who's going to pay the bills and feed the, feed the kids? She didn't say that. She said to me, you have to quit your job. It was that easy for her. Um, it became spiritual for her even. She felt a calling and a responsibility that she might have to reckon with one day when she meets her maker. And I knew that she felt that way when she told me this uh, in the crucial moment of decision uh, about two days before I ended up turning my badge and gun over and, and, and went private. She said to me, I will not let you jeopardize my salvation by not doing this. And when she said those words, and I knew she meant those words, that changed everything for me. And we jumped into really just I, saw, I thought it was this one where he talked it, about uh, because it wasn't rational in many in many ways. But ultimately, it ended the in real the real life. Oshkin, Oshkin, or whatever uh, some, uh, some the adult, guy young, young first. Women were in that group as well, rescued on that island. The first guy is arrested. Uh, have the time to report. Is in actuality it was 120. Um, there were two other locations being taken out at the same time. And there's a documentary that's going to follow uh, in, in the wake of Sound of Freedom called Triple Take. Angel Studios will put it out, uh, documenting the entire story. And so in the end, it was successful, and we were able to build upon that success. And I founded Operation Underground Railroad. I run another foundation that was founded by Glenn Beck called the Nazarene Fund, and we're doing these kind of operations all over the world today. So how, let's go back in time to before you worked as a security agent for the Homeland, Homeland, or an agent for the Homeland Security Investigations Unit. How did you, how were you trained to do that? Like, what was your background before you became employed as an agent? And what was it about you that made you capable of engaging in this sort of operation? So I, I, I got a graduate degree in um, international politics, and I always wanted to be in federal law enforcement. My first job was CIA. I was there during 9-11, um, working in the operations center. In the wake of 9-11, I found out that I studied terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, that was the, the, actually the degree I got at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. Um, and so... Um, it was an easy recruitment to the CIA because, you know, 9-11 just happened. When I found out that one of the terrorists, Mohammed Atta, had staged his attack from Mexicali, Mexico, across the border, and I speak Spanish, I wanted to go fight terrorism on the southern border. So I ended up jumping a ship from CIA, and I joined the newly created Homeland Security Department, and became a special agent. For six months, I was tracking those kind of movements, uh, you know, not, not even tracking Charlie's exploitation, but money, guns, terrorism. Six months into that endeavor, I was called into the office of, of a supervisor, and they asked me if I would please forego everything that I wanted to do with my career and help them start a child crimes unit. I do not know why they asked me. Uh, one thing he did say to me was, you're a young agent, but you're a person of faith, and we know that about you, and that's, that's a requirement, or your, your, your soul will be crushed. The Bible. It's a weird thing for a job requirement. I don't think that's uh. When you're in contact with whatever. people who are capable of that level of darkness, you start to understand something about the nature of the human soul that you. All right. Was there not? Was there? Where is? Profile signs looked at him before giving before being arrested. True. Ballard said the man identified as Ernest Wyshynski is based on a real case and the arrest at the coffee shop where he signed. I can't find anything on this, though. Uh, let's Let's look real quick. I know this is true. The relationship with one child, a little girl, Rocio, shown in the opening scene. Rescuing the final inspiration, blah, blah, blah. It's based on a child that Tim and R is still searching for. His name is Gardy, a kidnapped Haitian boy, and his father moved Tim to uh, uh, <coughs> Haiti. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Tim killed someone on a jungle mission. <laughs> Uh, near the conclusion of the movie, Jim Caviezel's character kills a man in order to rescue a child from you, and this never happened in real life. The addressing operation or whatever it clarifies Tim has never killed anyone, clarif contrary to what's depicted in the film. The organization says they do not act as a visual anti group. Uh, yeah, that was like a weird, that was like a weird thing. Like, why would you make that up? Um, uh, freedom. At one point, several of them are pretending to be doctors in the jungle border of Dominican Republic in Haiti to look for Grady. Yeah, they will find him, but they did give medical care to a number of ailing children. Uh, Bloomberg off to QAnon and The Sound of Freedom both rely on tired tropes connecting the film to pro Trump QAnon conspiracy cult. The beer movie for dads with brain worms. Really? That's funny. Uh, Mike Ross, da, 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 looking at QAnon concepts of these child trafficking rings. But the mainstream media covered in 2014 Island Raid.
Okay. Well, I this one person says that Tim Ballard said is true, so it's true. <laughs> um, you know what? Let's do this. Sound of Freedom True Story. If it'll load. I say maybe it's not in this. I could have sworn it was in this though. Yeah, I skipped over it. Well, he was cast. Goes into the real story, fighting for theaters, spiritual warfare. It's short. I don't trust Watch Mojo that much, but it's a short video. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're examining 10 things Sound of Freedom gets factually right and wrong. Sound of Freedom is based on a true story about real life heroes saving kids. For this list, we're looking at the fact and fiction behind Summer 2023's biggest truth of the day. We'll be discussing the movie's factual accuracy rather than the far fetched conspiracy theories that have been tied to the film. Due to the heavy subject matter, this is your mature content warning. Have you seen Sound of Freedom? Leave a respectful comment below. The inciting incident, right. In the fastest growing international crime network that the world has ever seen. Sound of Freedom is a film that has received praise and criticism, especially in terms of its factual accuracy. One of the events depicted that did reportedly take place is the inciting one. The film opens in Honduras, where brother and sister Miguel and Rocio are taken to a supposed casting call by their father. But when their father returns to pick them up, he finds no trace of them or the woman he left them with. Imagine walking into a room right now, seeing an empty bed. How will we tell? Tim Ballard, whom the film is based on, has admitted that this particular event was inspired by the acts of a woman named Kelly Yolanda Suarez, a former beauty queen who used her reputation to orchestrate such crimes. She's played on radar. Timoteo Nicholas, right. For Homeland Security, you know we can't go off rescuing Honduran kids in Colombia. After seeking to make a more direct impact in saving a child, the movie's Tim gets his first success when he's able to intercept Miguel being transported through the Mexico-U.S. border. While the name of the real-life Miguel hasn't been disclosed, this is how Ballard came to put him in protective custody. Soon after, in the film, Miguel gives Tim his sister Rocio's necklace with the name Timoteo on it. Timoteo, Timoteo, tu rescate mío es verdad. While Timoteo being Tim's name in Spanish makes this a huge coincidence, this is what actually happened. Though it took Ballard's son pointing it out at home for him to make the connection. This proves to be a major motivator for Tim, as it did for Ballard in real life. I actually told the producers to consider not telling the story because people won't believe it, and the little boy gave me a necklace. The average victim. Wrong. As soon as I lay down, I always see those kids' faces. One of the biggest grievances that anti-trafficking experts have is the movie's depiction of the average victim of human trafficking. In real life, about half of all victims are adult women. Most victims are trafficked for labor. The majority of young victims are actually teenagers. They also find fault with the movie's portrayal of how victims are trapped. So at this moment, she could be blocked on the road, or she could be in Moscow, Bangkok, LA. Victims are more likely to already be in vulnerable situations, with poverty playing a key role. In this sense, many experts find that the film doesn't accurately convey the root causes and champion preventative measures. God's children are not for sale. Strangers, wrong. When God tells you what to do. The real-life Tim Ballard has stated that the featured villains in the movie are all drawn from criminals he's encountered in his career, including the aforementioned Suarez. However, another generalization the movie seems to get wrong is the average perpetrator. Early in the film, we see a chilling montage of people absconding with seemingly random youths. Experts have also called this out for being inaccurate, as victims are more likely to know their aggressors than not. So, she's mm -hmm. often, perpetrators are locals, friends, or even family members, many of whom offer false promises. So again, you have another instance of the film supposedly not addressing the systemic issue at play. Vampiro, right. Yeah, that was Batman. Did it hit me. All of a sudden, I'm hit by this title. Me difficulty getting backing from his homeland security investigations overseers. Instead of returning to the U.S., he's compelled to continue his search for Rocio and thus resigns his position. He starts his own ventures in ensuring the safety of young people. While we only see these works, this okay. has made the organization a controversial one. So I don't think they're going to talk about it either. The opportunity to pay for external funding. Right. In December 2013, when the started the money, and that was like, oh crap, now the money's here, I'm going to have to actually quit my job. A lot of you are going to be mad at us. I'm even mad at you walking back to the war launch. I heard of this person. This channel started off talking about national parks, people that went missing in them, and the monsters that may have taken them. Since then, we've looked into a lot of cases and found that, you know what, for the most part, this really just was negligence or some sort of freak accident, and sometimes it was some form of crime. And occasionally, there is one that does feel like it really must be paranormal. Like, there's just no way that this person could have just dropped off the face of the earth without a trace. And then sometimes, it is monsters, but a different sort of monster. In 1958, Bobby Beezup, a 10-year-old from Denver, Colorado, was the victim of several priests at Camp St. Mallow on Mount Meeker in Colorado. Joseph Augustus Sorelli was sold by his parents in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm just going to write this down. And was unceremoniously dumped on the side of the road in a box. He was just four years old. I've seen some pretty Character, things, like children being harmed, vampiro, cults, rituals of self-deletion, and even cases of police just simply refusing to investigate the 
parents who have made it for me. But of all of it, the worst is absolutely when I have to tell you guys a story about a child who met an unfortunate death. So you can imagine that when I heard there was a movie coming out, an action movie, about a true story of a man and his organization who went undercover deep into the wilderness to go and rescue children from trafficking, I was, there, there were so many emotions, everything from anger that it took this long, um, to finally talking about a massive problem. You know, I thought, finally, this is a problem that is being recognized and is being brought to the big screen. I felt the same way about Wind River in 2017. Crew, obviously not the time, but now I truly, truly believe that film is so important, despite that it's only loosely based on a true story. Most of the stuff in that film is creative license, is narrative areas undercover as so doctors. You know, finally, I thought, this is, this is making it to the big screen. There will be change, there will be awareness. But then I learned some more things about the movie. It was slated for release in 2020, but it was owned by Fox at that point. And then when Disney and Fox merged, when Disney acquired the smaller company, they put it on the shelf. So thinking about Jeffrey Epstein and all the things he did and all the people he helped do things, and the fact that he very much did not himself, I, I thought, you know, it, it rang some alarm bells. Why is this massive company that has a finished movie about child trafficking keeping it on a shelf? Why do they not want people seeing this film? I had my opinions. You know, I, I thought maybe maybe there's something nefarious going on here. Maybe there's something that people in Hollywood want to hide. Obviously, there's a ton of stories from people like Corey Feldman, and you see people who got in big trouble like Kevin Spacey. So, you know, maybe maybe there was something bigger at play here, right? But I wasn't just gonna sit there and be conspiratorial. There were people saying things about the movie, and so I decided to go sure and time stamps, dude. That Disney was up to something. So I was rather shocked to see so many normal people, both in my real life and on the internet, railing against the child trafficking movie that I just saw. Because when I went in, I was like, this is there's nothing there's nothing about this that off the cuff, just watching a movie as an outsider feels off to me. Some of the numbers felt a little wonky. I was like, really, one to two million? But I, for the most part, I watched the film. I was like, there's really there's nothing controversial in here. Everybody should be able to get behind the message. Child trafficking bad. And most of the outlets I was seeing were leading by calling it some sort of QAnon conspiracy movie. Reporters were saying it was politically motivated, that it was full of anti-Semitic dog whistles, and one writer even called it a paranoid fantasy. Having seen it, I saw it, none of that. No QAnon. I kind of agree with a lot of this. No to be honest fantasy, with you. No conspiracy theory. No politics. So I dug my heels in even more and said, "My main issues with the ending of the film." This movie. I don't like it. I don't trust it. Then in a video on TikTok that got one and a half million views, and a video on Instagram that got half a million views. Identical video, two different platforms. I've never had an Instagram video do that well before. But the thing is, that got it kind of out of the echo chamber of people who saw Sound of Freedom and saw nothing wrong with Sound of Freedom, and people who maybe knew a little bit more about the specifics of international trafficking than I did. And from them, I heard a different reason to dislike the movie to discourage people from seeing it, and that was that Operation Underground Railroad and Tim Ballard, the guy who founded it, weren't effective, and that sometimes, in fact, they were worse than ineffective. They were harmful. People were all over my comment section telling me that activists, organizations, experts were all speaking. Also this. <laughs> saying this is another problem I have with the film. Ballard's tactics are not effective and they sometimes traumatize victims. When I tried to find a video that went over the whole thing fairly, all I saw was either entirely pro Ballard and OUR or entirely anti Ballard and OUR. There was no middle ground. It was just this is either, you know, Jesus Christ reincarnated or this is the evil worst people in the world. But I am well aware, working a job like this, that nothing in the world is black and white. So I decided if there's nobody else doing this, I'm gonna do it. And for that reason, I want to preface this video before we start getting into the details about the film and Tim Ballard, Operation Underground Railroad, the allegations against them, all of that, that I'm not doing this for political purposes. Nobody paid us to make this video. This is not us trying to uh, stand up for one side or the other. What we really want to Dude, do this we video are five minutes in. in Sound of Freedom, the story as Tim Ballard claims it actually happened because the movie Creative license, the allegations about some of the exaggerations Move on. lies that Operation Underground Railroad has supposedly told you. We're gonna go over the QAnon allegations and explain briefly what QAnon even is. And then finally, at the end of the video, there's gonna be a bit about what you can actually do, who you can donate to, what the statistics you need to understand are. It is not our intention to get you to like Sound of Freedom, like Tim Ballard, and like Operation Underground Railroad. It is also not our intention to get you to dislike these people, rail against them, and, and not see the movie. All we want to do is provide you with facts about one. this entire thing as it stands right now in the most unbiased way possible. It is not intended to lionize or demonize Tim Ballard, simply to equip you with the tools that you need to form an opinion and to help engage yourself in the actual fight against what is one of the largest criminal industries in the world. No matter your religion, gender, national political affiliation, we want you to come away from this video with an understanding of the truth so that we can all work together to end child sex trafficking. So at this point in the video, we're going to explain to you the plot of Sound of Freedom, what happens in the movie, so obviously there will be spoilers. I'm going to explain the entire plot of the film so that I can explain where the film made things up or change things around. In fact, to be honest, this, this video is almost entirely going to be spoilers for Sound of Freedom, so... And that lights a fire in Tim and gets him, you know, on, on the track of, I, I don't just want to capture and punch... Or at least in the words of a seven-year-old boy who has been horribly, horribly mistreated, he tells Tim's character that, like, I don't know what to do here, I'm... I'm... In the movie, very intense moment, very heroic, very, you know, gut-wrenching by the end Ashing Coco leaves with her feet and learns that she has been sold to the scorpion as his personal slave. Tim manages to wait for what the specific sting was called, and showing footage of the sting of the kids who were is an effective and sensible call to action against human trafficking, yet not free of issues in the depiction of sensitive subject matter. So basically what they're saying is, good movie, good cause, effective at communicating, but didn't quite do enough in certain circumstances to tell you important details. So that is the movie, that is Sound of Freedom. But what about Tim Ballard himself? What about the guy it's based on? Who is he? What did he actually do? But before we dive into criticisms of Ballard and OUR, we need to kind of go through what actually happened, because like I said earlier in this video, the movie absolutely takes creative license. There, there are a lot of liberties, there are a lot of things that had to come together to make this a coherent single narrative that you could sit through in a movie theater rather than oh, like a doctor. My head the is, as it says at the very beginning, based on true events, but those events have been mixed and matched. The first bit to address here probably would be Tim's history as a homeless. Damn it. I hit the back button. All right. In this video, the movie absolutely takes creative license. There, there are a lot of liberties. There are a lot of things that had to come together to make this a coherent single narrative that you could sit through in a movie theater rather than like a docu series. The film is, as it says at the very beginning, based on true events, but those events have been mixed and matched. The first bit to address here probably would be Tim's history as a homeland security agent, and specifically one who worked on child trafficking cases. Tim worked for 12 years for the Department of Homeland Security, specifically working on child trafficking and abuse cases. And before that, he spent a year with the CIA. Then 9/11 happened. They created the DHS, and he was shifted over there. And yes, the Department of Homeland Security is that new, and it is because of 9/11. In case you needed any more evidence that this video is not political for us, we're praising the federal government. I am sitting here telling you about a three-letter agency doing something good. At first, Tim's main job was pinching the consumers, getting them, and then watching through the material that they had so he could report it for court. 
Jones, which she says took a severe toll on his mental health, because when you think about what that means, I, I don't know how anybody could, could possibly do that and keep their sanity. He describes having to document materials involving children as young as five to seven years old on average. And he says that this was really difficult for him because he couldn't do anything to help these kids. He only punished the people who hurt them. But in 2006, a new law passed. And this law was a, a actually a sweeping addressment of the problems with child and human trafficking and how can the U.S. government update its policy to better fight this. Part of what it did was it allowed U.S. agents to go into foreign countries to catch Americans who were preying on children elsewhere and treat them as if they had committed their crimes on U.S. soil. So the United States, which has extremely strict laws that will, will very much get you if you're caught, it essentially made it so that people could no longer just seek going outside of the U.S. to avoid punishment. The United States has very strict laws, very severe punishments. It used to be you could go to Colombia or Thailand or something like that, where they have much less, where they have laxer laws, and get away with it. Now you can't do that. If an American agency finds out you're doing that, they can go get you and they can punish you. But he says that even with this law, it's still kind of hamstrung. Hold on. He's got sources here. Um, Town of Freedom is a box office hit whose star embraces QAnon. Yeah, you're Washington Post. Nobody wants to sign up for your bullshit. Town of Freedom is where I said real life. <laughs> All right, fuck you, Washington Post. Mission rescue victims. I think I've read this one. Man, they want you to just donate left and right, don't they? Holy shit. On here twice. <laughs> Uh, I grew frustrated after spending years trying to stop. Based on real people. Okay. Not finding anything here. Angel. Tim Ballard. Uh oh. This one doesn't say Shinsky at all. Down to Melodic Stage. It's faster to me to read in my head than it is out loud. My Game Boy's watching anyway.
it's like I'm just trying to find this one piece of information. Nobody wants to talk about it. They'll point it out as being like anti Semitic when nobody will actually talk about the real story. I could have sworn. Maybe I'm confusing it. Maybe I'm thinking of the border incident. You know, that could be the case. I'll just continue on. In some cases, there were issues with flexibility, money, how much time could be spent on these issues, and of course, if they couldn't find an American doing the crime, they couldn't do anything about the crime. This meant that there were a few cases where, despite the fact that he could rescue the kid, he had to leave him behind, or at least according to him. So, since history, what led up to him deciding to leave DHS and found underground freedom, that's how he portrays it. That's what he says about it. And from what I can tell, that that all seems to be true. I didn't find any anything that disputed that part. Additionally, I did find court documents. Okay, this is Buchanan. That mentioned special agent or ICE agent Tim Ballard going back to at least 2006. The next one up is Earl Buchanan because a lot of the critiques I saw focus on this story. Earl Buchanan is a real person. He is a real pedophile. He was really arrested at the Mexican border with a, a young boy who, in real life, was younger. He was five, but this is the one he dealt with based on. He was actually five in real life, not seven, and he decided, you know what, that's too dark. And he was arrested for possession of child pornography as well as sexual exploitation of a child. Tim says that Buchanan was transporting minors across the border and that his team received a tip about this. He also, at one point in an interview, said that at some point the kid, like, jumped up and hugged him. And from what I can tell, in one of the earlier interviews, it seems like he was saying that the boy jumped out of the van and hugged him, but I, I will admit there, there are some problems with the details here. In one interview, Tim did seem to imply that he was there when the boy was, was rescued, like when they made the stop and that he was involved in the stop, and the boy jumped out of the truck, out of the van, and hugged him and all that. It does not seem that that is necessarily the case, and in listening to some of Tim's more recent interviews, he's changed the story a little bit and it now matches the official case report more. But he says that the boy jumped out of the van, grabbed on him, and said, I don't belong here in English. And Tim then says that he learned that, you know what, he had, he had learned English because he had been taken as an infant. But there are people who have criticized that story and pointed out some inaccuracies. One of those is Damian Moore over American Crime Journal, who I, in the original version of these notes for this video, I was extremely critical of him. I was very hard on him. I had a back and forth with him on Twitter that resulted in me deciding that, you know what, I, I feel like I disagree with his analysis, but at the same time, he seems to want the same thing that I do, which is to end this problem. So I'm, I'm going to step back. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go in quite as much as I originally was going to on that article, but I am going to point out where the article got things wrong, as well as where Tim seems to have either misremembered or, or fabricated something. I don't want to assume, I don't want to assign motive to him. It, it could just be that in his mind, his memories have been mixed up. As we all know, memories malleable. But Damian Moore writes that Tim Ballard was actually not on scene when the van pulled up. He was not there for the child to jump out of the van and jump into his arms. That didn't happen. And the case report supports that because it was around 1630 hours when the van actually pulled up. And these reports say that special Okay, so this is just on Buchanan and, then. You know, witnesses and all that uh, around 1830 hours. So he was there two hours later because he had to make it down for Calexico. Now, one thing I took issue with American Crime Journal, Damian Moore's article, was that it portrays uh, Buchanan as just being a pedophile and a family friend. It was actually that they were, he was taking the boy to Mexico, not from Mexico to the U.S., to visit the boy's father. And it's true that Buchanan was a family friend of this boy who was referred to by a number of different names throughout. I'm not going to use one. We'll just, uh, Pedro is one of the names he used. So we'll go with that one. So he knew Pedro's family and they even called Pedro's grandmother and she said, yeah, he's, he's with my friend Earl and he's driving down to see his dad. So that taken as an infant thing, not quite right. Again, I don't know if Ballard was misremembering, if he was mixing this up in another case. I don't want to assume th that people were lying. But objectively, what Tim said in an interview from a few years ago was not true. The problem I took with the ACJ article was not that it was calling Tim out for, for telling mistruths, but rather that it did it did slightly downplay Buchanan's crimes in order to elevate Tim's exaggerations. Because Buchanan was not just a pedophile. He didn't just abuse one kid. The article says that he wasn't trafficking anybody. He, he was a pedophile. He had kid in his possession. He was crossing the border, but he wasn't trafficking. This neglects the fact that Buchanan had priors for alien smuggling. According that is the exact Okay, case that's case just more there, Buchanan stuff. Case, but the, the case report does say that he had a prior for alien smuggling and some other violations. There were actually a total of three tapes recovered from that car as well, one of which, at least one of which, I couldn't confirm the other two did, but at least one of which had uh, had CP on it. So after this arrest, they did some more investigating with Buchanan, and what they found was he was actually responsible for a lot more than just that. He was eventually convicted of having 11 child victims between the ages of 2 and 15, one of whom he was caught in the act of taking across the border, even though he had permission from the parents. But again, I look at that, and I look at all the other work that I've done, and I know the limitations of law enforcement, and the things that they can say, the things that they will say, the things they often choose not to say. So for me, I look at this, and the fact that he wasn't convicted of trafficking that boy specifically, to me, I look at that and I say, this is a pedophile who has priors for alien smuggling, taking a child across the border. To me, maybe that doesn't, beyond a reasonable doubt in front of a jury, prove that this man was trafficking children. But as far as I'm concerned, not looking at the legal definition, looking I'll read a lot of these articles, but I'm specifically looking just for one piece of information. There's enough evidence there for me to make the assumption that he trafficked that kid, and in order for me to believe he wasn't trafficking that kid, I'm going to need him to prove it to me. Thankfully, for all of his horrible, horrific, evil crimes that he will surely suffer an eternity for, uh, Buchanan is currently in prison. Now, of course, I would prefer if he were with our friend Chippy the Woodchipper, but that's only my preference. With all of that said, the report does say that Tim got there two hours after the, the, the initial stop, so something about his version of the story is either condensed or something has been embellished. In the version of the story that Tim told on uh, the Tim Pool podcast, Tim Cast IRL, because I was going looking for every possible interview I could find with this guy, and that one actually was really good. He, they, they really kind of like have him tell the whole story in detail, and in his version okay. of that, this didn't happen. All this stuff didn't happen at a burger joint. It didn't happen at a, at a border stop. He brought him back to a DHS facility and talked to him, and he said that uh, that the kid was quiet for a really long time, and then eventually, randomly, he, he got up and, and ran over and hugged Tim and started to talk. And it was like you know something. It was like something spurred him to go and talk, according to Tim. And again, this some of this stuff there is no way to prove or disprove it aside from witness testimony, and there is no witness testimony. Now, as for the issue of Tim going to Colombia to look for Miguel's sister in the film, that Tim says did not happen. That both the boy that, that was rescued there, as well as his older sister, both live in the U.S. Additionally, the arrest of Earl Benton Buchanan was in 2006. The movie moves that up. Note to self: 13, make my video a lot faster pace than this. And at the time, Ballard was actually working on two different cases. One of them was Operation Triple Take, the thing in Colombia. The other one was a case up in Haiti where he was looking for a boy named Guardy Marty, who was an American citizen, but his family relocated back to Haiti. In reality, he was told to come home from this operation in Colombia, and he did choose to quit his job instead. Of course, in the movie, he's the one being strong and firm, and as I said earlier, 
his wife is the one who's like, you can do this, I believe in you. And in real life, it was that he was hoping his wife would say no because he was scared. He didn't want to possibly lose his livelihood and not be able to buy for his kids. And his wife was basically like, we got a turn to be worried about. And I believe the exact words he said that she said were, you will not jeopardize my salvation. In the movie, a Latin American billionaire is the one who funded the Sting in Colombia, Operation Triple Take. In real life, and this one took me by surprise, it was Glenn Beck. It probably should be mentioned that the Sting in the movie is portrayed as being considerably more expensive than the real life Sting was. Like, at least four times as expensive. And it seems like they maybe bought the island instead of just renting it. it was, in real life, they rented an island, I believe. I believe that it was rather than it being a, a resort, it was that they were inviting them to a party. So they, they scaled things up for the movie. As for going into the Colombian jungle and all of that, and Rosia, and of course, well, if, if Miguel, the character, was based on Pedro, who of course was I can't find house anything house. about this first person. Well, that part was based off the search regarding Marty, and I have a little bit more detail on that coming up. But the reason that Gardy's case was brought into this was, again, just to tie the narrative together. Because again, what they needed to do here was not only make a Hold on. maybe bought the island instead of just renting it, it was in real life they rented an island, I believe. I believe that it was rather than it being a, a resort, it was that they were inviting them to a party. So they, they scaled things up for the movie. As for going into the Colombian jungle and all of that, and Rosia, and of course, well, if, if Miguel, the character, was based on Pedro, who of course was American, then how could they go into Colombia? Ah, we're getting there, because you know what? That part was based off the search Marty, and I have a little bit more detail on that coming up. But the reason that Gardy's case was brought in yeah, so, um, yeah, Guardy, I've already read about a little bit about, but I do, I do need to make a note of that. Um, this was, again, just to tie the narrative together. Because, again, what they needed to do here was not only make a movie about child trafficking, but also make a movie that people wanted to sit through. That's in Columbia, of course, as I just said, did happen, and it was a joint operation between the very newly formed Operation Underground Railroad, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Colombian Navy and Coast Guard. It was called Operation Triple Take. It actually took place in two places at once. They only show one of them in the movie, and they rescued 54 kids, all of whom were in the ages between 11 and 18. So, technically, some of these were adults, but they were 18 year old adults who had been trafficked for a while. So, we're not like really, this is not a, this is not a, well, some of them were adult situation. It's a, these were kids. And one thing that broke my heart researching this is that uh, Tim said that while they were on the island, of course, all the kids had no idea that they were about to be rescued. They thought they were all about to undergo a horrific amount of abuse. So, he says they basically got all kids, gave them snacks and drinks, and put them in one area while they took the traffickers elsewhere and worked out the deal while the law enforcement to get there. But he says that one of the boys came up to him and asked him uh, if, if they were going to give him, like, cocaine or something to, to numb the pain because he was scared. He said that they always gave him something to drink. Of those 54 kids, according to CBS, 29 of the 54 were under 18. So the rest of them were just 18. Of the traffickers themselves, Tim says they're all real people, but their names were changed for the story. And as far as I can tell, that seems to be true, or at least I can't find anything to the contrary. The reason that I'm inclined to believe That's that this is true is on. mostly because of one specific character, who in the movie I think is, goes by the name Giselle, right? Isn't it? Yes, Giselle. And she was a former uh, Miss Cartagena. He, she, was, she was a former model, beauty pageant queen, all of that. And in the movie, that's how she's portrayed. And when I went and I looked at the news stories from when this event actually happened back in 2014, that, that checked out. That is what happened. A very beautiful model went and helped abduct these kids. Her name was Kelly Johanna Suarez, and she is a real person, so it makes sense to me that all of these would be real people. And according to the Daily Beast, Kelly Suarez was a known person in Colombia who did this, who would organize fake photo shoots and fake modeling agency stuff so that she could bring kids in for trafficking purposes. And again, that is the Daily Beast. The Daily Beast also confirmed that the operation did happen, that it was called Crystal 2 by the Colombians, and that it did involve U.S. Uh, immigration Customs Enforcement as well as the Colombian Navy and Coast Guard. Why can I find Kim anything about this Oshinsky? is not true. This is also on Angel Studios' website, and it's also on OUR's website. So they've been very forthcoming. Uh, the links will be in the description to both of those articles from those sources about what is fact and fiction in the movie. We're also going to link a uh, fact and fiction in Hollywood article. Where I, I want you guys to understand that the point of this video really is not to paint you guys a picture. It's to give you guys information. So I'm going to give you as many sources as I can. Um, they're also open in tabs on my laptop, so I'm just going to grab links, and you'll be able to see any of these in the description. Again, we don't want to tell you what the article said because we want you to listen to us. We want to give you a video where you can sit here and learn what the article said, and then if you so choose, go and look at the video yourselves because we, we're not going to lie to you. But point is, that mission in, in Colombia in the jungle didn't happen, or at least it didn't happen the way it happened in the movie. That did happen, but it was in Haiti, and they crossed over to the Dominican Republic, and they did go into a camp, and they did pose as doctors. They had actual doctors and nurses there who did render actual aid, you got actual medical supplies, but the operation failed, and it was criticized by a number of people for several reasons. Some people were criticizing this, and this, this was the search for Marty, who disappeared in 2009, and Tim says that he promised Marty's father that he would keep looking for his kids, so he did. Um, but in this version, they went into a village in the Dominican Republic. They brought their doctors. They brought some. They brought a camera crew along as well, and some people on the jump team who were journalists. Who we'll, we'll get into it later, but they did not do the best job of preparing some of these people. But HumanTraffickingSearch.org does confirm that the event did happen. That people did pose as doctors, but also that some of the methods here were not quite the best they could have been. One such example would be the fact that uh, his source for why they were looking at this village was a psychic medium from Utah. But the silver lining was that some people got medicine, so that's good. Bill Camp's character, Vampiro, is also real, but they made some changes to him. His story about why he started fighting against this was changed. Uh, in the movie, he says that he accidentally purchased the services of an underage uh, lady of the night, and that when he realized when he found out that she was 14 and not 25, he he felt sick. Okay, and so. I don't have any. There, he has no links either to this stuff one. Is, but he says that God spoke to him and told him not to do this. Not like you know, in his ear, God talked to him. But again, I realize as a Christian, it's a lot of this stuff makes sense to me innately, and I'm trying to explain it as best I can to somebody who might not have been raised in that environment. But the idea of God speaking to you is not that you hear a voice in your head; it's that you see certain signs around you and you realize, oh, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. You may not believe in it, and that's fine. But there are a lot of people who believe in it strongly, and for them, it can be a very serious motivator. In the real version of things, uh, first of all, Vampiro in the, in the story actually went to jail. In the, in the movie, he didn't ever go to jail in real life. He, he just stopped working for the cartel. Uh, but in real life, the woman was of age, but he found out that she was either her daughter was being exploited or she was allowing her daughter to be exploited, and her daughter was underage, and so that's what in real life drove him into into helping with this issue. So that is, you know, what Tim said about most of the story. 
and that kind of covers all of it. I know it was a little all over the place, but those are the major points that Tim covers where he says that the movie differed from the truth. Now, of course, we weren't just going to take Tim's word for it because that would not be fair. That would not be doing a balanced review of the sources. That would not be analyzing this. This would be that would just be telling you, you know, hey, here's what he said happened. So what we did was I sat down and I read so many articles, but I picked a couple main ones to look at, and we went through the criticisms of the film. I will say most of the things that critics were attacking were things Ballard has addressed in some form or another, or that Operation Underground Railroad has addressed, or that Angel Studios has addressed. I can see the argument that maybe the movie should have had a part in the epilogue that said, okay, here's here's the things we changed, or that there's a part at the end of you see it in theaters where Jim Caviezel speaks directly to the audience. There was maybe a moment. I don't. There doesn't need to be. You don't need to say it's based on a true story and then explain what you changed, because a lot of films do that. Texas Chainsaw literally says based on a true story and it's bullshit. You know, it's. I don't. I don't know. I guess Sound of Freedom is Sound of Freedom trying to. Well, let's find out. If Sound of Freedom is trying to be a biopic, then yes, you probably should. But if it's just saying that it's inspired by a pre story by a true story. Based on the incredible truth, it's sold as a biography. Okay, no, then yeah, they should be a little bit more forthcoming <laughs> about what they changed. It's a fictionalized story based on a true story. It's not a biography. If it was a biography, it should stick a lot closer to the facts there where he could have said also here's the true story here's what we changed here's what makes it match i can see that there were other opportunities but not within the main narrative of the film and also i mean something that i've been struggling with in, in trying to do this and again i'm really trying to not put my own opinions into it but it does bother me a little bit like i don't think anybody's going to see oppenheimer which is out right now and going you know well th these little things were wrong and nitpicked and, and terrible yeah but i okay i'd have to look into oppenheimer to actually say anything but like the thing is is oppenheimer's story like they i don't feel like the main story is like the main story to Sound of Freedom, the narrative structure of Sound of Freedom is made up, but based off of real things. Where I feel like Oppenheimer is probably more based on real things and then made some things up to tie it together more narratively. Like a little bit of like an opposite spectrum, but I could be wrong. I don't think people do that with most movies that are based on a true story. And people have said, well, maybe the reason Disney didn't release it is because it says based on a true story and there's too many liberties. I mean, it's not Disney, but another very big movie company, Warner Brothers, had absolutely no problem releasing the entire Conjuring series, despite the fact that Ed and Lorraine Warren are pretty well-known frauds. Or at least Ed Warren. Lorraine actually might have been a psychic. If you're curious, we... Uh, okay, but the thing is with that is, is the Conjuring movies aren't labeled as a biography. They're not, like, if you type them up, yeah, biography's not even here. And it also says just based on the case files of the Wer Warrens or Warrens, however they say their last name. I think it's like a potato-potato situation, you know what I mean? But, like, that's the thing is, like, it's just basing, it's making a horror narrative. Sound of Freedom did the exact same thing The Conjuring did. It took real people and their realish stories and then made a narrative around that. That's what Sound of Freedom did. It did the exact same thing. The difference is Sound of Freedom's literally the first the first category for genre is biography. That's the difference. All right, now that we have that out of the way, We do, in fact, have a video on, on some of the Ed Marine Warren cases. We have one on the Annabelle Ball. We have one on the Andy Hill case. And I believe Wendy Goon also has a video on the Warrens if you want a more rounded outlook. Uh, ours focuses on those cases. But yeah, a lot of the criticisms were related to how the film portrays events. We've already covered that. We'll cover a few of those. But for the most... Also, The Conjuring is not asking for a bunch of donations. The criticisms I wanted to focus on were the ones that weren't about the movie, but were about Tim Ballard, Operation Underground Railroad, and some of these alleged QAnon connections. He was criticized by an anonymous member of that Haiti operation, the one that was looking for Bernie Marty, where he brought in a psychic to help look for bringing in a psychic. Operation Underground Railroad's response to that was that Janet, the psychic, had actually been referred to them by a law enforcement source who they said had success she had successfully helped them in the past. For this section, I mostly used a Vice article as well as a number of others. I had a Washington Post article up actually that did a really good job of fact checking the film, which shocked me. But when Vice went to OUR with questions, OUR provided them with some statements and also a few links specifically regarding this whole psychic medium thing, which one was to a 1993 research paper that I was only able to access the abstract for, and the other one was a link to a Forbes article, which is a profile on a psychic who claimed to work with law enforcement. Personally, for me, I, I would not, that would not be enough for me if OUR would do that to me. But I also don't trust Vice, so I went and I read the abstract myself. And it's a good thing I did because Vice did not accurately represent what the abstract said. The paper does refer to the use of psychics as controversial, but Vice left out the rest of the line. That line says, but psychics have long been and will continue to be involved in unsolved criminal investigations. Vice. I don't care about the psychic things. It's not in the movie. I'm only interested really in the movie, like what the movie is grifted from and gifted or whatever is birthed from and the controversies kind of surrounding that, part of that abstract, which I guess it kind of is, but it's not important to me. Use psychics. Vice simply says that most organizations don't use psychics. And I, I just don't like the framing. I don't trust Vice. You shouldn't trust Vice. This is not an agenda thing. This is a Vice writes to give you... The, Vi when Vice writes an article, it used to be that Vice did hard-hitting documentaries on the ground documenting the Ukraine Civil War. Now Vice is BuzzFeed. They write clickbait. But I will say they are very diligent about their clickbait and they write very long-winded clickbait. So it's useful for research purposes if you're trying to figure out what somebody's saying. But the important part here is that the paper's conclusion, and this kind of... I'm not saying that this vindicates OUR using a psychic, nor does it vindicate Vice criticizing them for using a psychic. But what it does say is that there's really no conclusion on the effectiveness of psychics. We have actually talked about a psychic being used in investigation on the yeah, channel. Psychics are bullshit. That in that, it, the psychic was interesting in that there was some stuff that she was able to pick up on that she probably shouldn't have. But 
the same time, she also didn't leave anywhere, anybody anywhere useful. But yeah, Vice frames the paper as concluding that psychics are ineffective, and I'm not telling you psychics are effective, but I am telling you Vice lied to you. The paper comes to no conclusion, at least the abstract, which I know Vice didn't read the paper either. Vice also criticizes... Okay, so there's nothing here. ...operating tactfully and bringing camera crews around, suggesting that he's doing this all for the, the fame and the glory of documenting these. Of course, on Ballard's end, he says they document it to prove it's happening and to be able to show people that, yes, your donations are making a difference. You can choose to believe either one of them. I'm not going to tell you which. In my opinion, it is a valid criticism to say that bringing these camera crews along can make it harder to work a little bit more low-key and to, to pull one over on people. It might make people uncomfortable, might even scare people. So, yeah, I can see the criticism there, but I think that by Vice making it about Tim's ego rather than, you know, basically what Tim said it was about, I think that's going a bridge too far. I think that they don't have the evidence to really back that up. So, yes, it's fair to say that that is probably not the best tactic, but I don't think it's fair to say that it's either. The Vice article makes a number of other allegations and references another article of theirs, which is on OUR's habit of exaggerating, as they say. The Washington Post writes of that specific Vice article in 2020 that it found no clear falsehoods in Operation Underground Railroad's rescue claims, but Vice alleged a pattern of image burnishing and mythology building, a series of exaggerations which are in aggregate misleading. So again, Vice said that they found no clear falsehoods in OUR's accounts of their operations, but that there was embellishment and exaggeration. But you might be asking, what kind of embellishment or exaggeration? What specifically happened here? According to Vice, Ballard claims that Operation Underground Railroad played a large and central role in a major New York State trafficking case, but Vice says that Operation Underground Railroad doesn't seem to have been involved and that the girl that is repeatedly referenced by OUR escaped on her own and that OUR was not involved. Vice claims to have identified the real case of a girl who goes by the pseudonym Liliana, but they chose not to link to the case because they were worried about her privacy and they didn't want to expose it. Of course, Liliana's case has been talked about in front of Congress an entire year before any of this happened, but the exact case number was not mentioned. Now, again, I'm trying not to engage in any assumptions here, but if I were the one writing the article, I would have provided the case. I would have embellishment and exaggeration. But you might be asking, what kind of embellishment or exaggeration? Yes, it's fair to say that that is probably not the best tactic, but we I think it's fair to say that's Vice article makes a number of other allegations and references another article of theirs, which is on OUR's habit of exaggerating, as they say. The Washington Post writes of that specific Vice article in 2020 that it found no clear falsehoods in Operation Underground Railroad's rescue claims, but Vice alleged a pattern of image burnishing and mythology building, a series of exaggerations which are in aggregate misleading. So again, Vice said that they found no clear falsehoods in OUR's accounts of their operations, but that there was embellishment and exaggeration. But you might be asking, what kind of embellishment or exaggeration? What specifically happened here? According to Vice, Ballard claims that Operation Underground Railroad played a large and central role in a major New York State trafficking case, but Vice says that Operation Underground Railroad doesn't seem to have been involved and that the girl that is repeatedly referenced by OUR escaped on her own and that OUR was not involved. Vice claims to have identified the real case of a girl who goes by the pseudonym Liliana, but they chose not to link to the case because they were worried about her privacy and they didn't want to expose it. Of course, Liliana's case has been talked about in front of Congress an entire year before any of this happened, but the exact case number was not mentioned. Now, again, I'm trying not to engage in any assumptions here, but if I were the one writing the article, I would have provided the case. I would have given you the case so you could form your own opinion instead of telling you what the case records say. They do quote some of her testimony, which includes that she was trafficked out of Mexico at the age of 14 by her boyfriend, who upon reaching New York began selling her to other men. In Tim Ballard's account of this case, she was younger when she began being groomed for trafficking, which, again, without the actual case details, working only with pseudonyms, I was not able to find out which case it was I was not able to access the case records. So I can only work with what they have here and what Tim said, which is frustrating because now I'm basically going with hearsay from two different sides. According to Vice, at the age of 17, she one day called a cab, told her captors she was going to visit family, and then left, never to return. But Vice did something a little weird here, which is they quote Liliana herself a whole bunch of times, and then that specific Can we just talk about the Oshinsky? Because, like, I've heard. I've heard at least a couple of sources say this film's anti-Semitic based off of that. And that's what I'm trying to like write about. Again, because Vice didn't link to the story, Liliana is a pseudonym, and I can't find it. I like I said, I could have sworn in this one. You can't understand any other way, and that can be a, I mean, that's the sort of thing that gives people post-traumatic stress disorder when they're soldiers. So and, and now you said also your supervisors had an inkling that you might be protected against that, at least to some degree, because of your faith. So let's walk through what you learned and encountered first. What what did you see when you were working as part of this child sex crimes unit? What I saw was so shocking, Jordan. Uh, I thought child sex crimes would be 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds. Uh, my brain couldn't comprehend something more evil than abusing that age. The very first case I worked in 2002, I believe, I was given a, a bunch of VHS videos, some hard drives to look at that had been seized and weren't. The very first um, image I saw um, were, um, there were three, uh, three little boys uh, <clears throat> that were probably seven, five, and three, and they looked, uh, like, they looked like my children. They had, you know, they had blonde, blonde, eye, blonde hair, blue eyes, and they were being just raped, raped, these three little boys, by this pedophile. And I was so shocked, I fell to my knees, I dry heaved, thinking I was gonna throw up uh, into the wastebasket. I jumped into my car, I drove to my children's school, my three oldest kids, I checked them out, I still remember in my mind, I can still see dentist, dentist, dentist appointment I wrote, and I grabbed them, I took them home, and just sobbed on the floor, my wife came in, and I just, I wouldn't let the kids go, I was just holding them and shaking. Um, that was my very first experience. Uh, you talk about PTSD, I absolutely deal with PTSD to this day. Um, I, I took too long to actually deal with it, uh, that's another story. Um, and I thought, I can't, I can't do this, I can't do this. Um, I started getting help immediately, because uh, I didn't want to quit. Uh, and uh, that, that's, that's what this is. That's what this is, and um, those kind of videos- I'm heavy in this section years, here. Thousand percent. inside a maximum security prison when I was a kid. I worked with a very strange psychologist that was there. And one of the things that really shocked me, and I, I think this shocked me enough to change my whole life, was I, I, met this, I met this one prisoner who was a pretty nondescript looking character. He took me for a walk out in the yard away from a gym full of like weightlifting axe murderer monsters and rapists. And we went for a walk out in the yard and the psychologist called us back and told me later in the office that this guy is about 5'2", pretty non-prepossessing guy, had uh, made two policemen kneel in front of him, beg for their lives in reference to their families, and then shot them both in the back of the head and, and kicked them aside. And the shocking thing to me was, you know, you, you kind of think that if you met pure evil, it would it would have a monstrous form. And, you know, the thing that shocked me about that was the nondescript nature of this guy. You know, his, his absolutely banal ordinariness, the fact that you could just walk past him on the street, you'd never know. He wasn't some monster, you know, the monstrous character of Satan in your imagination is, you know, a figure that's terrifying to behold instead of someone normal
My Maybe in this so section. Much what you very nondescript. People of all walks of life. We've 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 arrested and I've interrogated um, educators, uh, lawyers, law enforcement, clergymen, um, and and uh, sitting across from them, there's but with no apparent physicality that would tell you who they are. But I will say this: when they start talking and I look into their eyes, that's when I can I sense something that, that, that really scares the hell out of me. Um, and the way they talk about children when they get there and it's it's something that they've been able to normalize and they're speaking to me about children almost like they're talking about you know like uh, the weather or you know talking about buying and selling children like you're talking about buying and selling computer parts or, or an automobile or something and that's where i thought you something has taken over you something non-human has made you less human um and i've never been able to figure it out uh, only that it creeps me out and and um you know i usually end up getting them to confess because they have brought themselves to a place where they think they're okay they think that it's somehow normal I don't know if that makes sense. How do they, Dr. Peterson? Well, 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 well the, the degree of rationalization that has to, with each, with each step forward in the progress of the fantasy, there has to be a step forward in the self-deception with regards to self-description, right? So imagine that you're, you're attempting to cling to a sense of yourself at least as normal, but even maybe as a moral agent. I mean, the, the more forthright pedophiles claim that they're only allowing children to express their true sexual desires and that what they're actually doing is forming the best relationship with the children that they've ever had. Now, of course, there's part of them that knows that that's an absolutely bloody, screaming, hellish lie, but you get to that lie, like I said, with a thousand micro lies, right? And you're modifying your self-conception along the way. I mean, have you had these people justify themselves to you? And if so, by what means do they attempt to do that? So one person that comes to mind, absolutely the answer is yes, and one person that comes to mind is the person depicted in the film, Oshensky. Uh, this person had written uh, articles. Uh, there it is. Self-published, of course. He had a book that he actually sold on Amazon, and his understanding, or his... his just Have you had these people justify themselves to you? And if so, by what means do they attempt to do that? So one person that comes to mind, absolutely the answer is yes, and one person that comes to mind is the person depicted in the film, Oshensky. Uh, this person had written uh, articles, self-published, of course. He had a book that he actually sold on Amazon, and his understanding, or his, his justification, was that the puritanical society of this country has crushed the true uh, and, and, and beautiful and righteous uh, sexual experience, uh, which the, the most natural would be between a man and a child, a prepubescent child. A prepubescent child is, 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 the, is the most beautiful form of humanity, and, um, and why, why take that away from a child? Children would be so well uh, conditioned to, 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 to confront the challenges of life. If only they could experience orgasmic pleasure, even in a prepubescence. Um, and, this is how they talk. Give right, me right, a right, 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 right. Well, that, you of that, there was attempts made in the 1970s by French intellectuals, surprise, surprise, to have the age of consent reduced. So I have the name and that was here, always the rationale. It? it was an extension of the patriarchal oppression theory in some sense, right? That all sexual expression is essentially pure and good in its most fundamental form, and it's all warped by social pressure. And if we were just allowed to express ourselves in every manner that we saw fit, then everyone would be free and we wouldn't suffer anymore from the constraints of, of tyrannical society, right? And it's just convenient for the bloody pedophiles that that happens to justify them doing whatever they, the hell they want. All right. Who was Aaron in Sound of Freedom based off of? Why is this non-existent? Dude, I have like looked everywhere for this. What's this? Oh, it's just a review of it. Damn it. Gosh darn it, Bubby. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't find anything. Oh, uh, Oshinsky. Oh, Ernest Oshinsky. I can't find anybody. I can't find anything about this.
anything. Like the case was in, I could not find the actual records. However, that little bit, that, that tiny shred of evidence that another victim said she called a cab and escaped that way. That is the only evidence well, that Obi-Wan was not in any way involved with this case at all. I want to make sure that's in my... So never said that they rescued Leon. He simply said that they helped her and that she was in their care. While testifying in 2019 before Congress, Damn. Jim did tell a person Leon's story, which differs slightly from the Vice account. Again, don't have access to the records myself, but in that story, he references Liliana as a survivor. He does not reference her as somebody that Operation Underground Railroad rescued. I actually didn't find any examples of him referencing her as somebody that Operation Underground Railroad rescued. They seem to explicitly have said she's a survivor and she's in our care. Maybe they did get in contact with her. Maybe they did tell her what she needed to do to escape. Maybe she rendezvoused with one of their team somewhere. I can't tell because Vice didn't give me the article. They didn't give me the case. Additionally, Tim Ballard's testimony when he does mention Liliana wasn't about stuff that was going on in New York. It was about trafficking at the border. So he was more telling her story in relation to how it had to do with her being trafficked out of Central America into the United States. So it's a weird time to bring this up. He does mention her in 2019. Supposedly. But again, no mention of rescue there. So is Tim being vague? Yes. Were his testimony and the op-ed written at a time when she was actively involved in a court case and he had to be vague by necessity because he couldn't comment on an active court case in detail? Also, yes. And this is something I've, I have experience with. There are a few different cases that we worked on that were active cases. Well, probably the most famous one that we talked about is the Gabby Petito case, which we have a direct line to Gabby Petito's family. We have been in oh, contact with them for them with them since she first went missing, and there are still things they can't tell me. Additionally, in that op-ed, he revises what he has said in the past about the Buchanan incident because he says that it was Customs and Border Patrol that snagged Buchanan, and he does not take credit. He also doesn't say he was on the Caleb part. I'm about to say by telling you guys I am not taking sides here. I'm trying to give you the truth. Vice is being dishonest in their article, and it's not the, it's not blatant lies. It's not the kind of thing where they're telling you something happened that simply didn't. It's the kind of journalistic dishonesty where you you bury the lead or you find a way to say what you want people to think without technically lying, but you're you're, you're not presenting the truth. You know, you know what I mean? Lying by omission and such. They spend the entire article saying that Operation Underground Railroad didn't do anything for Liliana, only to mention in the 45th paragraph that they actually have no information on whether OUR was involved or not. They couldn't. They just don't know. According to the Vice article, a spokesperson for the U.S. Attorney's Office and lawyers involved in it declined to comment to Vice, and it remains unclear how OUR was associated with the case. So Vice spent 44 paragraphs telling you that OUR was not involved in the Liliana case, only to tell you in the 45th one that they actually don't know if OUR was involved in the Liliana case. Aiden, as a former journalism major, how does that make you feel? Not great. Exactly. They go to say what is clear is that OUR's interactions with private and public infrastructure have left no discernible trace. Now, of course, if your goal as an organization is to do undercover busts, that would make sense. That said, if OUR is going to take credit for aspects of these cases, I would expect them to eventually come forward and say what they did, at least so long as it doesn't endanger the victims and survivor themselves. So, yes, there is room for OUR to be more transparent here. I will 100% endorse that and say yes, these organizations probably should be more transparent when possible. Based on a real person, wrote had just finished and wrapped up. So, hard to say exactly what was going on here, exactly who had access to what articles and, from other experts, and as a book said or done, on but experts actually say, and Vice quotes them as saying that they're unfamiliar with OUR's work. So essentially they're saying because these other organizations don't know Bro. what Operation Underground Railroad does and they're not connected to them, well, they, they must not be found. The article suggests that Vice went to experts Hello. and said, here's what Operation Underground Railroad does. The expert said, well, that's not really how that works. Ballard said. What Operation Underground Railroad does. And again, I'm not saying this because I, I want you guys to distrust the Vice article. I'm linking you the Vice article so you can go read it yourselves. In my opinion, the Vice article is garbage. They do exactly what they accuse Operation Underground Railroad of doing, which is they paint a narrative for you. They don't adequately go into, you know, here's the pro, here's the con, here's the for, here's the against. They just tell you what they want you to think, and they only provide you with just enough evidence from their sources to make you agree with them. That's why I went back and everything that they cited, I read it myself. And time and time again, without fail, what I found is that Vice misrepresented their sources. But again, don't take my word for it. The article is linked in the description. Go read it. And one of the experts, well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to badmouth her. I just think that Vice was doing the wrong thing in including this. It's a semantic argument that gets brought up. It's a, it's a legitimate fallacy. They put Anita Teeker's safe horizon saying no one will say they're caring for someone. They'll reference cases, which of course Ballard said she's in our care. But it was an active case when he said that. So did Vice not tell them that? Did Anita Teeker not know that? Did she not realize that? Is this just a semantic argument for the sake of making semantic arguments to derail the conversation? I don't know. But because it's Vice, I'm gonna assume this is all on Vice. But my issue with that specific quote being included is that it's not addressing Ballard's actions. It's addressing Ballard's However, actions. Teeker also said that the Office of Refugee Resettlement would usually have a hand in caring for somebody like Liliana. But again, Vice didn't provide any information on how OUR was associated with the case, and nobody wanted to talk to Vice. The, the law enforcement, the attorney general, the lawyers involved in the case didn't want to talk to Vice. So instead of Vice just being honest and saying, sorry guys, we don't know what to tell you here, they decided to write the article anyway. And largely left out of all of this is the fact that Tim Ballard was on Trump's anti-trafficking council. So he probably had a, a good amount of weight to throw around. All of Vice's criticism in the article boiled down at their core when you go back and you read their sources as well to, well, Operation Underground Railroad doesn't work for the people we like, so they must be bad. And I'm not just saying that, I'm gonna quote them for you. The seeming near complete lack of ties between OUR and the established network doing the difficult work of serving survivors of trafficking in New York specifically and the US generally does not suggest that it did not provide Liliana with valuable support. What it does suggest is that the group has few relationships with the people and institutions who do the work and little engagement with their normal processes. So to reiterate, the fact that Operation Underground Railroad does not work within the established network of resources in Vice's own words. Do you have any? That they were not involved in Liliana's case. Again, I was wondering if he had any sources. That the group has few relationships with the people and institutions who do this work and little engagement with their normal processes. And that no. was buried in the 57th paragraph of an article entitled A Famed Anti Sex Trafficking Group as a Problem with the Truth. Do you see the irony? He does not have any articles li listed as sources. They don't actually talk about Operation Underground Railroad and Tim Ballard here. Instead, they compare Operation Underground Railroad to International Justice Mission. They then go on to talk about the ways that International Justice Mission has screwed up without ever mentioning a single time OUR did. The two are not the same organization. The two are not run by the same people. And the two don't even have the same exact tactics. They have worked together on, I think, two or three missions. But this is an article about Operation Underground Railroad. And they're just saying, well, Operation Underground Railroad's tactics are similar to people who have done bad things, which means that Operation Underground Railroad is also doing bad things, but they provide no evidence that Operation Underground Railroad actually did traumatize anybody, at least Vice doesn't. To back up this claim, right. they link to another Vice article entitled Anti-Trafficking Charity OUR Has Another Murky Rescue Story. But in the 12th paragraph of that article, it's That's admitted as far that as I'm going with that one. They then admit they have no further details, make a bunch of assumptions, and levy some attacks
of the real story is wait hold on what what am i saying here while the actual story of the brother and sister wasn't real made up for the film the main key points of the real story that is what was i even trying to say here do i have like an aneurysm uh sound of freedom is based on a true story and that true story is around Tim Ballard's work in Operation Underground Railroad, also known as R, which is an anti-trafficking organization. While the actual story of the brother and sister wasn't real made up for the film, the key points... There... are... key points... that are true. Yes, Tim Ballard worked for Homeland Security and Internet Crimes Against Children, ICAC Task Force Unit until Task Force until him and a few special operatives left to found to yeah you know, to find to found Operation Underground Railroad in 2013. The main focal point of the true story is based on Operation Triple Take, which was a sting operation that led to over 100 individuals being rescued not just all minors this was done at two locations and yes a beauty queen was involved as one of the traffickers this being showcased in the big island bust scene in the film Um, so we'll look into, look into Operation Triple Takes Real Story. I'll look into that here in a minute. Uh, the scene at the border is based on a 2006 case where Earl Buchanan was stopped at the border in Cali, Caliexo. I don't know how you say that where he had a young boy with him and no ID for the boy. They found a videotape where Buchanan was the boy and notified ICE, which responding agent was Ballard. Ballard. Ballard claims that the boy jumped into his arms, gave him a medal, and asked him to find his sister. However, while Buchanan's story is confirmed with court documents, Ballard's statements are not reported at this point and are just hearsay. The character Vampira is based on a figure named Batman. Dive into Batman. Uh, Ballard and the crew have gone into areas undercover as doctors, been a search for a boy named Guardy, and... Not Rocio. Uh, Ernest Oskinski is supposedly based on a real person that wrote articles and a book on pro arguments on this. Ballard says he read the man's book and got him to confess after he gave him got him to confess after the man gave him a signed copy of the book. However, I can't find any other information on this case at all. During a Jordan Peterson interview, Ballard mentions the real-life case, and an article by Caleb Park says it's true, but there's no evidence to back it up. But no evidence to back it up. That's all I've been able to find on this one so far. All right. Um, what are some of the other focal points of the movie? So, the boy and the girls bullshit. So that jumps into the next part where we bust Oshinsky. He uses Oshinsky to set up the Earl Buchanan. So the Earl Buchanan line from Oshinsky is not true. Uh, he gets through Oshinsky, gets Miguel, which is, I think is what his name was, right? It's Miguel and Rocio, right? Uh, who he rescues, who he did rescue from 2006. The boy gives him a medal, asks him to find his sister, but that didn't actually happen, even though Ballard says it happened. It's just hearsay. Uh, from there, we set up the Island Sting, which is based on Operation Triple Take. Operation Triple Take happens, and <clears throat> that leads into them not finding the sister, which prompts uh, him and Batman to dress up as doctors to go into the jungle to find Rocio, which he comes across at a plantation, kills a guy. Well, I say plantation. I don't know if it's plantation. Kills the guy, and then escapes with her reunites with the daughter and that's the end of the movie okay so i'm just i'm looking at the the narrative of the movie um no evidence to back it up and then all right well if that's the case let's look up operation triple take 
Operation Triple Take. Is there a documentary on this? I'll finish that video later. Is this it? Is this the is this the documentary? Or is this it? Let's watch this one first. Part of Sound of Freedom that reminds me most of Operation Triple Take was the beach scene, the beach rescue. That is how it looked. That is how uh, it was all set up. And I was able to be on the set a few years ago during the filming and having seen the images of the island raid and then seeing what the sets had been, how it had been created. It really was just a, a stone's throw away from the actual site of the rescue. Why oh, does that guy look like he's crying? <laughs> With Triple Take, I was one of three team leads. Tim was in charge of Cartagena, Batman was in charge of Medellin, and I was in charge of the town of Armenia, Colombia. Okay. In Operation Triple Take, I play the role of a groomer. So a groomer is somebody who travels with these rich either Americans or people who are... So is there more than one location? Was there three locations? Coming for these sex parties. The groomer is somebody who actually, like, accepts the children into the party, right? Whatever the groomer is supposed to do to prep the children for either the sexual acts or whatever is going to take place at the party or the event. I was assigned uh, over... The investigation that was being done in Armenia, Colombia. Some preliminary work had been done to come up with the contacts that we were going to be meeting with. Matt and I had gone down there and made contact with them, met with them on several occasions, had them show us, you know, what they were offering, had dinner with them several times. We just continued the investigation, found out that the allegations that were there were true, got more people with us to go back down, conduct some more of the investigation, met with them again, and, and then uh, set up the uh, takedown at the house. Operation Triple Take started out as just one operation that was going to happen in Medellin based on a case that Batman had found with an American pedophile known as Dennis de Jesus. That case then expanded when CTI in Colombia, their FBI equivalent, asked us to go in an area near Cartagena in the Peru Islands to find Playa Blanca in this area that they believed was a uh, site for child traffickers, those who were selling kids. A few OUR operators went there, posed as tourists, and sure enough found that kids were being sold there. So CTI in Colombia asked us to set up a second operation. While we were preparing those two operations, CTI said, and we now have intelligence that there is a suspected child predator in the town of Armenia. Uh -oh. Someone named Martin who's producing child sex abuse material. Can you go check that out? So I was tapped to be the leader in Armenia, and we were going to initially do those three cases within about a week to two week period. And our Colombian counterparts told us, no, 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 we're not talking about a week or two. We're talking about an hour or two. You have to do these all almost simultaneously because once one sting happens and the media it goes viral in public, all of the other traffickers will be scared away. So you have to do all of these in one hour, three operations, three cities in Colombia. Operation Triple Take. So it was three. It wasn't two locations. It was three. According to this. Where's the... I say, I thought there was a... Uh, I thought they... I, everywhere I've seen it, they were saying two, right? Um, does it say anywhere in here? Oh, no. All right. Operation Underground Railroad, or is a non-profit United States-based anti-organization founded in 2013 by Tim Ballard. The organization has been criticized for its conduct during scene operations and been accused of exaggerating claims regarding its work. There have been no actual verified resources performed. Wait, what? There have been no actual verified rescues performed by the group. And the group's claims of rescues have misaligned, misled donors and public about what the group does. The group claims to have conducted multiple seeing operations, some outside of the United States, and donated technology, technological and monetary resources to law enforcement agencies to combat trafficking. The group's founder, Tim Ballard, was the subject of an internal vacation in 2013. Blah, blah, blah. Don't care about that right now. Uh, it was founded in 2013 with Tim Ballard. He said... Prior to R, he served 12 years as a U.S. special. I hate this chair. I hate that I won't stay up anymore. Uh, it is like five years old, though. According to the to expose first in the CIA. It's just faster for me reading in my head. Uh, Uh, okay. Hold on, what was this down here? God, I hate this chair.
<laughs> All right, we'll just finish this then. Because we're not actually preparing them for any sexual acts, what I do is we have candy. I just I don't know how much I trust pizza, like coming drinks, from the original water, source. Things to help the kids just relax because we want them to feel comfortable. So things we do is we play games like if there's a beach ball or something like that. We'll play games with the kids. We try and laugh with the kids if we can keep it like hearted. I sat across the table from four or five traffickers, including Eduardo, including the Miss Cartagena, the beauty queen Kelly Joana Suarez, Fuego, and Samuel, and just sitting there watching just how vile these humans were, how diabolical and despicable when they were just talking about these kids and what they would do and what type of sex acts they would provide and how much money would be required. And it really took everything I could to not come across the table and strangle them or not you know, throw up in my mouth, not say you know. You guys should go to hell, but to have to keep that in, have to stay in character and enroll, knowing that if we pulled this off in just a few weeks, these kids would be back with their families or embedded aftercare homes. And I'm just grateful to God that that's exactly how things played out. It seemed like it took forever by the time we had the authorities there that were going to take them down, that we had the undercover house set up, and then they finally showed up. And if, if I remember right, they brought a small bus with these kids. And then seeing the sheer numbers when we play those roles and they bring the kids in, we, we put them out back by the pool with some people to keep them safe while we did the deal in the, there at the kitchen. And I just remember all those kids filing past me the whole time. And I just think, my goodness, you know, that's just a ton of kids that they rounded up to do this with that were willing to exploit and, and victimize like that. They keep all the traffickers away from the children because once the sign or the signal is given via Tim or whoever the person is on the operation with them for the local authorities to come in and arrest us, they want that happening away from the children. So we keep the kids in a separate kind of spot from that. And then the actual traffickers themselves, they're around the money. So they have actual cash, dollar bills, they have beers or whatever they're serving the actual traffickers in the negotiation. Triple take tells the true story behind the sound of freedom. Three cities, one operation, hundreds at stake. Uh, sound of the movie continues. Documents ours operation twenty twenty four team order to take involved several simultaneous team operations in three different cities that resulted in more than one hundred traffic victims to be arrested. Okay, so it's one it is three. Real news for real Texans. <laughs> Utah Attorney General Shane Reyes, who participated in Operation Twenty Eight, is featured in the documentary, adds a sobering statement. We're not winning the war, he said. It's getting worse. Triple take. Is this any? Is this available anywhere? I don't think that's the same movie. <laughs> I think it's this. I'm going to assume it's probably this. And I'm going to assume there's not a, a part two. Actually talking money. And what they actually have to do is they have to get the traffickers to admit that the children are underage. They have to get them to I think this is mostly true. At this event, and then to actually exchange hands. So, so those are a couple of things that have to happen before we can then tip off the local authorities. Let me focus the part on the reminds me most of Operation Triple Take was the beach scene, the beach rescue. That is how it looked. That is how uh, it was all set up. And I was able to this be on the set a few years ago during the three building. Three I haven't seen the images of the island raid. Locations. And the sets had been, had, how it had been created. It really was just a stone's throw away from the actual site of the rescue. When I watched The Sound of Freedom, what reminded me the very most of Triple Take would be the characters that Jim Caviezel's playing in Batman. Um, just the sheer way that they portrayed how things happened. It was very impactful on me to see even some of the funny things that happened and the feelings that were on their faces that you could see when Jim Caviezel's character and Batman are sitting at the table and he's telling the story. You know, I, I sat there and I listened to them fairly close to that story also with him a lot of the time that I spent with him. To see that in the movie, that was, that was, uh, that was very impactful to me. It's a little emotional, you know, when you've been there in real life and you've seen it and you've been a part of it. Surprisingly, the part that was the most emotional for me was... Um, they're putting the kids in shipping containers. And there was a day that we spent in Haiti and the Dominican Republic on the border right there. And on that border, they traffic children back and forth across the border. So they take these kids from Haiti that are in these slave labor camps and they traffic them across the border of the Dominican Republic. And then they make them work all day long in these um, sugarcane fields. And then they also sex traffic them. And seeing the shipping containers, I just had this emotional response of watching these moving trucks. Okay, where are they? One of three team leads. Tim was in charge of Cartagena. Real story takes place in Cartagena. Him was there. Batman was in charge of making Batman Vampiro was in charge of a sting in Medadine. I was in charge of the town of Armini. Another operator. Matt Osborne was in charge of Armenia. These three stings were done simultaneously. Ah, oh, damn, I was close. I was spelling that right. Some of the 
the low coastal regions to the Andean Mountains, Colombia is a beautiful country, rich in culture, rich in history. Although it has historically been rife with internal conflict, the Colombian government is working to create a peaceful country with protection for civil liberties. Our relationship with the Colombian government is growing and is strengthening. Sex slavery, of course, is present everywhere in the world, but the Colombians are doing something to fight back. Months ago, our team carried out an operation jointly with the Colombian government to the nine victims, most of them children, from sex slavery. Five traffickers were arrested in that operation. It was the first case of its kind ever to be prosecuted in that region of Colombia. The Colombians were so excited by the success that we had, they asked us to come back. They asked us to work with local prosecutors to find more leads, to find more traffickers, to find more kids that we could rescue. I mean, this is being narrated by Tim Ballard, so I don't know how much, like, I don't know how reliable, reliable, rely, relying, reliative. <laughs> I can't think of the word now. I, I don't know how, like, reliable, reliable. I don't know how reliable Tim Ballard is as a narrator. These beaches are beautiful, and they serve, unfortunately, as a haven for wealthy travelers. Not just travelers, but pedophile travelers to come and engage in their grotesque fantasies. Within 30 minutes of stepping onto that beach, I was approached by a guy who called himself Fuego. I think it's about all there is to Operation Triple Take that's interesting that deals with the movie, right? Uh, the character Vampiro... Sound of Freedom Vampiro. So I was like, Lupita, if your mother lives two blocks away, why are you living here in this orphanage? And, sh and she's like, oh, you know, my mom for uh, $5 of crystal meth used to put on porn videos and whatever they did in the porn videos, I would have to do with the man that came and gave her the drugs. And I'm looking at this little girl. I'm just a little girl. And I was like, if, even I, I've done a lot of things. I couldn't conceive of that. I started out in investment banking, and I think my senior year of college, my net income was 20, 25 million. And so I, I had a, a partner, and one day he said to me, he said, we can make a lot more money um, if you're willing to, to go to Europe. And I said, okay, what, what are we talking about? Back then in Europe, the tax rate was 7%. So he sent me over to Europe, and I started laundering money for not cartels, doctors, lawyers, corporations. So that's how I got my understanding of... That man was a cart. The fuck? Money laundering. Anyway, Batman was a money launderer for the cartel for a cartel not there's no just one central cartel other than maybe blackrock i was at a party um, i was dating a girl at usc i was living in newport beach at the time i went into the bathroom and as i'm walking in there's this, this guy in there and we just started talking and he's like hey you know do you want to come to my birthday party and he said it's in mexico i'm like yeah, yeah i'll go we exchanged numbers i thought i'll never hear from the guy so i'm at my office in, in newport coast and he calls me and says hey we're gonna pick you up at the airport i'm like we're going to mexico let's drive it's like no, no we're flying so i get to john wayne in a private jet he's there in a private jet he's got four of the people in the plane and we fly and we land on a private strip in, in south of uh, tijuana north of ensenada and we land on a private strip and, and there's guys in cars machine guns and all these things and i'm thinking okay this is this is interesting um we get out we go to the party it was like something you see out of a movie the waiters walk I will say this, Vampiro seemed a lot cooler than this dude. Around with ladders, with cocaine, <laughs> joints. And this guy walks by without security, and, and he goes inside the house. Well, like, three minutes later, two guys come out and they grab me, and they're like, hey, come with us. I get taken into an office, and he, he's there, and he puts a gun in my mouth. And he's like, we know you're DEA. You know, gas, he's like, hey, what, are you, what are you doing here? And I'm like, man, I, hey, hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to point to this kid that invited me. Thank God the kid that invited me was his son. He comes in, he's like, no, no, he's cool, he's cool. They ran everything. This is back. Computers weren't, you didn't have technology like you have it today. They knew everything about me, where I lived, all the businesses that I'd had, bank accounts, within 15 minutes. They knew everything. Like, like data that is, is not available. They knew everything about me. So it came up, you know, he's like, so, you know, what, what do you do? I'm like, oh, you know, I want your money. I'm thinking, the way out of this is to, to be a criminal like them. Um, and that's where the relationship started. So I, they were not cartel, per se. Um, they were independent bankers. Um, we worked for all the cartels. We worked with anyone that had money. He had me flying all over Latin America, um, making relationships and moving money. Look like, for the I cartels. Like, I, I knew it was dirty. I, I was sleeping with a lot of women, doing drugs and around people. I, I saw a lot of people get killed. I'd been in shootouts. Um, you know, I, it just wasn't something that I, that I really wanted to do. So I'd gotten out and they called me and they're like, hey, we've got a big one. I was, was going to make like $5 million on a couple hundred million in Valley. And so I, I talked to this to my friend who's the son. I said, listen, I'll do it if you go with me. And he just got married. So me, him, and his wife get on one of the jets and we fly to Valley. So we're at dinner, everything's going great, loving meals, and all of a sudden we heard this massive explosion. And I don't know if you go back, um, that disco tech was blown up by terrorists. And so that was that was it for me. Um, I, I got on a plane the next day, I flew back home, and within a week I was on a flight, the last flight that ever left Los Angeles, directly to Havana. I was on that plane. Flew to Havana and I started smoking cigars, Cuban cigars, and I just fell in love with Cuba. I got connected there to the Minister of Finance, um, started doing investments. They wanted boats, they wanted fertilizer, started out small things. Um, and then I raised $30 million to help them build, and I funded two hotels in Havana. As soon as the hotels were up, the way Cuba works uh, as a foreign investor or a foreign investment group, they own 51, you own 49. Hotels get up, I was supposed to start getting paid, get a call to come to Havana, showed up in Havana, and Fidel had me thrown out of the country. 
gave me a ticket, and I had all my cash, everything I had left, was in bank accounts in Cuba, put me on a plane and said goodbye. They sent me back to Tijuana. So I spent 10 days living on the street, and I started to feel peace. Like, I hadn't watched birds fly or felt the grass on my skin. Um, the library was there. I was stealing books from the library and just reading, like, three Clancy books every two days. And I thought, wow, you know, that there's actually more to life because I just spent the last 15 years doing two, three things. Money, girls, and party. That's all I did for 15 years of my life. I got connected to a small orphanage in the red light zone on Calle Efe Martinez. And so God sent me right back, like, right right there where I, where I used to be evil to where I was doing good. And I started helping out this orphanage, and it was an American couple that ran it. One day I'm sitting there, and I'm with Damaris and uh, Lupita. Lupita's like 10, and Damaris is like 13. And so we're having this conversation, and Lupita said, my mom's coming to visit. It was a Saturday. She said, my mom's coming to visit tomorrow. And I said, Lupita, where, where's your mom? She's like, oh, she only lives two blocks away. So I was like, Lupita, if your mother lives two blocks away, why are you living here in this orphanage? And, she, and she's like, oh, you know, my mom, for uh, $5 of crystal meth, used to put on porn videos, and whatever they did in the porn videos, I would have to do with the men that came and gave her the drugs. And I'm looking at this little girl. I'm just a little girl, and I was like, even I, I did a lot of things. I couldn't conceive of that. I didn't know that that existed at that point. I was speechless, and I looked over at Damaris, and I'm crying, and Damaris is just looking at me like something's wrong with me. Lupita's looking at me like smiling, and I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? So I asked Damaris, I'm like, and you? Are you too? And she told me just crazy stuff. I mean, living in this alley, and her mom would go to work and getting raped by all the neighbors because they knew that mom was gone all night because she was a prostitute there. But I went back to the hotel that night, and I just cried. And I don't think I slept at all that night. I just cried and cried, and I was like, how, how can this be real? Like, I didn't know what God was calling me to yet. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to serve in this orphanage. And that's when God spoke to me. He's like, yeah, you're going you're to rescue these kids. And so that's, that's where it started. Okay, not that interesting. Vampiro is one of the most colorful characters in the movie. Sound of Freedom Hour is a real person with a true story. Stop reading if you do not want to get spoilers for the movie. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Vampiro's character is based on a real person. All the details attributed to him are in the movie are not according to Operation Ground Road, which is Ballard's nonprofit organization. In the movie, the character of Vampiro is a former money launderer for the notorious Cali Drug Cartel who went to prison, got out, and decided to devote his life to rescuing children from secondary networks. And after encountering with juvenile whatever he initially thought uh, was an adult but learned he had been learned had been trafficked here's what you need to know in real life vampiro never went to prison and the story pro unfolded differently according to the r website the character vampiro also known as batman is based on a real person the website says all actor people can't place a character in the movie according to screener everything about vampiro when he was being introduced to tim in the film is true except when they say he spent time in jail the real the real batman had never been in jail added the film in the film Batman tells Tim he's changed his life and started helping with people to fight against after because he slept with a who ended up being a 14 year old girl. The realization that he went that he was adding to the darkness almost drove him to until God intervened and redirected his efforts. This is true, except for the part where he says he slept with a in real life the woman he slept with was an adult victim and he realized that her younger daughter was being exploited. While she was away, which drove him to join the fight. Okay, so that part's true. Okay, so uh, based on when he laundered for the cartels, uh, he never went to prison, like the movie says, and never slept with an underage victim who was trafficked like the movie as the character say instead he started his I don't know what you call it new crusade after meeting a young girl whose mother was putting her out. What did he actually say in this? So I was like, Lupita, if your mother lives two blocks away, why are you living here in this orphanage? And, and she's like, oh. He said, listen, I'll do it if you go with me. And he just got me, gave me a ticket, and I had all girls and party that's all i did sorry i was doing good and i started helping out this orphanage and it was an american couple that ran it one day i'm sitting there and i'm with damaris and uh, lupita lupita's like 10 and damaris is like 13 and so we're having this conversation and lupita said my mom's coming to visit it was a saturday she said my mom's coming to visit tomorrow and i said lupita where, where's your mom she's like oh she only lives two blocks away so i was like lupita if your mother lives two blocks away why are you living here in this orphanage and, she, and she's like okay so his claim was helping an orphanage and the other person's claim was he slept with the woman's mom uh okay well let me sound of 
Freedom Vampiro. Let's look at that again from Heavy. Um, uh, is, according to Screen Rant, everything about Vampire. So, so that's just based on Screen Rant. Okay. I'm just not going to include it because it doesn't seem relevant. The the actual true part that's between both stories is this. Uh okay. Battlers crew has gone into areas uncovered as the doctors, but in search for a boy named Guardy and not Rocio, who they still have not found. And I think that's it. I think that's all the true points of the story, right? Um I think that's all the true points of the story. It's because so let's top down from the from the okay, hold on, let me write this. Let me write this. That way I can So while the film does have some based on true story moments, it also overly Exaggerates. <laughs> How the fuck do you spell exaggerates? Spell exaggerates. It overly exaggerates, simplifies, or makes up information to make a more cohesive. Story, which is a problem when you're labeling the film as an as an incredible true story and a biography. <laughs> biography. Um Ballard, the two main children are made up, but based on two separate, separate children. Um, Ochinsky said to be real, but... Um, the character based on Ochinsky that sets up the main plot of the film is a supposed separate case. In the film, Ochinsky leads to Buchanan, Buchanan's, uh, actually, that's a good question. Is he named Buchanan in the movie? The Earl Backman? Is that him? Yeah. Okay. Uh, leads to Buchanan, who's named... Earl Backman in the film. And in the film, when this actually took place in 2006, was, uh, Ballard did not take the boy 
out for burgers. Claims the boy jumped into his arms and gave him the necklace and asked him to find his sister, but it's only here say. Is hearsay here like H E E R or is it H E A R hearsay? Is it this? Or is it this? I bet it's this actually. Okay, so it's not. <laughs> nice. We've learned something new today. It is one word. Hearsay is one word. I, if I would have just done that, I would have figured that out on my own. Um, or, but is only hearsay. Um, but is only hearsay. After reuniting the boy and the father, which didn't happen, Ballard goes to Columbia to find his sister he starts he meets vampiro who's based on batman with a mostly made up story that's not the true story um there they set up a billionaire's a hold on members only club to as a disguise for the sting. Hold on, Glenn Operation Triple Take Glenn Beck. Uh, Glenn Beck joins Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, Glenn Beck says, duped by friend. What? <laughs> What's this? Why is it taking so long to load? Sometimes Firefox is dumb like this. Closest allies of Operation Underground Railroad founder Tim Ballard now says that he feels duped and betrayed by his friend. New specialist Lindsay Arendt has the latest developments. Why are you Lindsay? not on 2X? Conservative radio host Glenn Beck has long backed OUR and Ballard. He took to his show Wednesday saying his media company has interviewed five women who claim to be victims of sexual misconduct by Ballard. Beck says his media company was set to publish an investigative... Oh, whatever. Um... I thought Glenn Beck helped fund this, but is Glenn Beck just a supporter afterwards? Last year, a crowd of nearly 5,000 people gathered in St. George to take a stand and a walk against human trafficking. The hashtag Rise Up campaign is an effort to stand up against human trafficking organizations. Slavery is something that did not end with the abolitionist movement in Abraham Lincoln. It's something that is ongoing still today. And it started with the abolitionists then, and we need to continue to stand up, to rise up, to get loud, just as they did. Glenn Beck. It's more prevalent on the earth than it ever has been. And Operation the thing is, is that the focus of it is on our under children. Each year on July 30th, Operation Underground Railroad joins in that effort on the road against trafficking. This year, Glenn Beck was invited inside on Mailman stage must be here. to speak on his efforts in joining the anti-trafficking train. He was welcomed by leader and founder of OUR, Tim Ballard. Both kneeled down on stage and prayed, knowing that God is at the helm of their work. Glenn Beck says he's completely due by friend. Is there... That's fine or whatever. Is there, like, information, like, how far back Glenn Beck goes? Uh, I spoke for a pretty ugly breakfast. Uh, Rescue Beck's Nazarene Fund. Uh, Who funded Operation Triple Take?
Bow, wow, wow. Um. Six point nine million in revenue to the IRS. That's in revenue, right? Twenty-two point three million in twenty nineteen. So it's making profit, and they're not saying what they're doing with the profit. <laughs> and the dude doubled his salary. That's awesome. Um, anyway. All right, I'll look that up in a minute. Uh, they decided to set up a members-only club as a disguise for the Sting being backed by a wealthy... Person, I can't remember exactly. I have to look in the movie. Um, <clears throat> does it say his name in here? Just Pablo. <laughs> I think it's him, or is it? Or hey. Uh, Sound of Freedom. Let me look real quick. Truth. Uh, movies and straight to his on the controversy. Q uh, on energetic. But the sound of freedom is also generate a similar amount of scathing left wing backlash amid both the media so that the Q on adjacent rhetoric and the film's target audience, multi left wing critics. It's uh, exactly like they were at Top Gun. Really an effective hype machine. <laughs> I don't care about any of this. Uh... All right. Uh... Group filmmaker saw funding for a he and a group filmmaker saw funding from the reality series that would depict the rescue from a trailer. The series never came to fruition. Some members of the product uh, Ballard released 2016 The Abolitionist that gave Ballard even more mainstream legitimacy. Uh, <laughs> Also, Disney probably shelved Sound of Freedom because it's a Christian movie. More than anything. Okay. All right, uh, back by a wealthy person. They said we were going to close the size for a team, being back by a wealthy person. Yet, 
many children there. We said them free and bust the captors. This operation was actually done at three different locations simultaneous. Simultaneously. Ah, yeah, close enough. It was done simultaneously. Uh, with freeing over 100 individuals of, I'm just going to say all ages, of all ages. Uh, oh, dinners over 100 individuals of different ages, not just minors. Cause I don't know how old some of them were. I don't think some of them were like, like senior citizens, you know what I mean? Um, okay. So Batman was not at this bust. Eh, it doesn't really matter. Right. You're going to get different minors. Rocio wasn't there, which propels Ballard to look to Ballard and Vampiro to go undercover as doctors to look for her in real life. I don't know if Ballard went undercover. Um... Tim Ballard Grady. Um, they ever find Gardy? Is it great? No, it's not Gardy. It's not Grady. It's Gardy, right? It's missing. The Tim Ballard podcast. The donors, according. What's this? It's from Fox. What's this? What are Tim Ballard's lied to donors according to our X X R employees? A series of documents released by Utah's Attorney General is revealing intimate details surrounding a criminal investigation into Tim Ballard nonprofit organization. Ballard agreed R was the world's leading organization fighting against human trafficking, but former employees say many nonprofits accomplishments and funding raising techniques were highly exaggerated or outright false. Uh, majority of the record, the great, the accurate records, whatever made up. Uh, Mr. Austin, Mr. Reeves, at this point, say you told by Davis County. One I have a subpoena or any co witness, including employees, and former employees, such as A small sliver of two information evidence is attached to give you a flavor of issues. We assume. Oh my goodness, there's a lot here. Um, all right, I'm gonna have to read that in a minute. I'm trying to see. I'm speaking of the dead. Uh, one of the origin stories of Ballard and our focus is on a long standing search for Mr. Chani and Grady as part of the criminal investigation. Prudy reviewed video recordings of Russon communicating with Ballard about his quest for Grind Grady. It is apparent that Janet Russon is the source of intelligence being used to locate Grady Pretty Road during the last of our mission. Russon reportedly gave pinpoint psychic advice on Grady's location, leading Ballard and his operatives to Hilltop Camp. Intelligence would be accurate, called Plant Suppress. Uh, we verify that Grady was anywhere near the Hilltop Camp of Psychic Readings Pretty Road. Tim told him multiple. In conversation, conversation with a different team that members exactly what they need to prove that Grady was there and that special forces were going to be able to drop in helicopters. I don't think it's Gary. I think they missed a letter there. 
Those statements about Tim and the ins and this incident are false pretty right. It appears that the entire scenario that Tim uses to portray this event is completely fabricated or drastically exaggerated. Never once was a gun raised in a threatening manner to anyone and never pointed at anyone. Tim was never seen on camera to be hold a book of any type, let alone a Bible with a Book of Mormon. Um I'm going to have to read, I want to actually, let me reopen this because I want to, I want to save that for later. I feel like that's going to be an important thing to read. All right, Vice. No. Uh, excuse the missing children. That's the psychic from Utah thing again. Uh, Tim Ballard. Undercover as doctors um okay hold on sound of freedom true story let me see this caleb park keeps popping up he's not gonna pop up this time is he nope uh, what about history versus Hollywood? Is this one in here? Um, this one might actually have sources. Good job, go to Columbia. Oh, yeah, that's also worth mentioning too. Uh, said the free this coverage was on three different locations. She wasn't there with propels. Uh, to bust the captors. Uh, during this setup, Ballard's commander, commander tells him to return, to which he quit his job to continue. In real life, Ballard left in 2013 to set up o u r so this was a mistelling of events this operation however was actually done at three different locations however called operation triple Take. All right. Um. Blah, 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 blah. No. After Operation Triple Eight concludes, Sound of Freedom movie, Tim or Jim Caviezel poses. The doctor goes in Columbia Jungle by himself to try to rescue the little boy's sister who is still missing. While in real life, the little boy did have a sister. Tim's jungle search in the movie was instead very loosely inspired by the organization Real Life Search for a boy named Grady, who had been kidnapped from the grounds of a father's church at one point several years. Uh, is there no source for this? Really? I'm not sure. At one point several years, Operation Team led your operators pretending to be doctors into the jungle border of Dominican Republic. Uh, Tim led a team. Okay, in real life, Tim led a team of o -R -U -R operators pretending to be doctors into a jungle on the border of the Dominican Republic and Haiti to look for Grady, Gardy, <laughs> I just couldn't help the rhyme. They did not find him. Uh, movies, filmmakers. Okay, so you can take liberties. You can, but I'm not gonna pretend. Whatever. Uh, okay, so that's fine. <laughs> Um, 
operation. Actually, here's right here. Do you have a video on? All right, let's go from oldest to newest. Uh, join I'm an abolitionist because operation. Maybe this one? This one's for Haiti. I'm trying to find where they go looking for Grady as doctors. Operation Railroad. Um, On Super Bowl Sunday, 20 girls were freed oh, from human trafficking. Can you see? I'm just going to mute this because apparently it's just going to do this. Instead of actually like showing anything. I mean, not showing, but saying anything. Uh, So this wasn't the search for Grady, was it? Nope, not the search for Grady, law enforcement, Texas. Um, all right, we'll do this then. Uh, o dot u dot r Grady or Gardy. Find Guardy, the oh my god, is this just an advertisement? In twenty thirteen began Operation Underground Road was sparked sparked by the story of beginning Guardy Marty who is kidnapped from his family. Guardy Marty. Um discover Okay, this is from their actual website. Let's see what their actual website says. Nothing. Okay, cool. Um, inside a massive. Inside a massive anti trafficking charity's blundering overseas missions. Operation Underground Railroad claims to save children. People, blah, blah, blah. The rescue mission was on the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic and was not going well. The anti-trafficking charitation R had arrived in a remote village seeking a missing child. Acting on what founder Tim Ballard had promised was a solid tip from the source. A group from our so-called jump team had entered the village pretending to be a part of a medical team. Reveal real medical workers had been hired as cover and were providing actual care to people in the village while operators, as they are called, Riley surveyed the scene where the missing children were nowhere to be found, and then to the dismay of people on the ground, Ballard produced his source, a psychic medium for Utah. Sick. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's redo this. Uh Rusi wasn't there for us to go undercover his doctors. In real life, uh Tim and OUR send a group of operator operators operators and real uh, disguised as doctors and real doctors into to Haiti and the Dominican Republic to look for Gardy, Gardy Marty. Um, Public to look for Gardy Marty while doctors. Doctors did the doctors thing. The operators would scout the area. 
and scout the area. Uh, highly survey the scene of the missing child is nowhere to be found, and then a psychic medium from Utah. The child in question was Guardy Marty, a Haitian boy in the United States who was nearly three years old when disappeared from his father's, I guess, in Marty's church in Port uh, Prince in December of 2019. Uh, this was a catalyzing event that led to Ballard to founding R several years later. By 2014, Ballard and his team of operators, a group of asserts, is highly trained and skilled. I mainly uh, read more here. That links to Vice. Okay, so. Um, all right, so. Let's scout the area. Scout the area. Um, Gardy Marty is a Haitian boy born in in the US who was around three years old when he disappeared from his father's church in Port uh, Prince in December of 2009 this case being a catalyzing, I'll use our wording here, catalyzing event that eventually was part of the reason Ballard started OUR. However, this operation was based on a source. I don't know why that's there. Oh, person claimed to have sex slaves. And to help the mission on the border of Haiti was anti Was based on a supposed solid tip Ballard claimed that was actually from a psychic medium from Utah. All right. Um, so pretty much from after the island bust, the rest of the film is completely made up including the village invasion and murder that Ballard commits to save the girl at the end. Uh, do I go on a rant about them claiming this is a biography? So the film does have also over over exaggerates, simplifies, or makes up information to make a more cohesive story to the problem when you're labeling the film as an incredible true story or a biography. This This back into the film is is what makes the film feel exploitative in nature because it's completely falsified and uh, dramatized for entertainment. And entertainment only which undermines some of the good points the film makes 
about child trafficking. Child trafficking. All right. <clears throat> this even spring boards more into the gross pay it forward message at the end of the film. And then now we can get into the pay it forward stuff. So I'm going to bounce for today.